Hey, you're running through a vast field at night, as if something is chasing you right now. The light of the full moon brightens your path, and you see a circle of light around it. You run on looking for a safe shelter. It's not about werewolves, who are said to appear when the moon is full. Soon, this place will be the epicenter of a major storm. This very circle around the moon is called a halo, and ice crystals cause it in the sky. When the moon is full, it reflects a lot of sunlight. These rays then pass to the Earth's surface, but they curve their trajectory and split as they pass through hexagonal ice crystals. As a result, we have a halo of different colors, almost like a rainbow. The inner edge of the halo is red, and the outer edge is blue. It looks beautiful, but the presence of ice in the clouds means this ice will soon turn into water and begin to fall to the ground. And this rain will be so heavy that you'd better find a shelter beforehand. If the weather is quite warm and the clouds are closer to the ground, you might see a similar phenomenon, a corona. It's much smaller than a halo, but much more colorful. The bluish-white disc on the inside turns brownish-red on the outside. Unlike halo, the corona is made of water droplets. The smaller these drops are, the larger the corona will be. If the water droplets are large, the corona will look like a bright spot the size of the moon itself. Both the corona and halo might also occur during the day when the sun is shining. But be sure to wear sunglasses before just glancing at it, because it's very bright and really bad for your eyes. As soon as you find a shelter, it starts raining heavily. Whoa, what is that? Are you being photographed? No, the flash you just saw is lightning. Bam! Thunder is so strong, the windows in the house start to shake. Here's a tip on how to tell if you're far away from the epicenter of a thunderstorm. When you see lightning, start counting. 1 1,000, 2 1,000, 3, and so on. When you hear the thunder, stop counting. Now you have to divide that number by 5. If you can count to 5, it means the epicenter of the thunderstorm is 1 mile away. If you didn't find a shelter before the thunderstorm started and it caught you in the open, leave the high ground immediately. Any mountain or hill is a high-risk area. Don't even think about hiding under a tree. Tall objects are the first target for lightning. Power poles are also at risk. If a thunderstorm catches you riding a bike, drop it immediately and run away. Same if you were riding in a convertible, golf cart, or motorcycle. If a thunderstorm started while you were in an open field, the tallest object here is you. Get down and try to cover yourself somehow. If you're not alone, try to keep your distance from each other. Whew! Now, let's admire the beautiful sunrise. It looks like someone spilled red paint on the sky. This beautiful view means it's about to start raining. You can see a red sky at sunrise because the high-pressure zone has just passed you by and is now followed by a low-pressure zone with high water content in the air. So take an umbrella with you or go back to a warm bed and stay indoors. There's an old saying to keep it all straight. Red sky in the morning, sailor take warning. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Sometimes you can even predict rain by smelling it. It's all about ozone molecules. Storm currents bring ozone down from the upper atmosphere. And when the storm is about to start, you can smell a sense of cleanliness. It's like you just washed the floor with clean water. Your sense of smell gets more sensitive before it starts to rain. It's not because of your nose, but because of the more humid air. Flowers spray their scent, and the water molecules stick to it, spreading it much better. That's why the same flowers smell different when you smell them outside or in a closed, humid greenhouse. Plants can also help you predict changes in weather. If you touch the grass in the morning and it's wet, it means it's going to be a clear day. That morning water on the grass is dew. It appears at the coldest time of night. Clear skies allow the Earth to cool a bit, and the water vapor molecules in the air turn into a liquid that settles on various surfaces. Take a closer look at the leaves on the trees. Sometimes they can be upside down. For example, maple leaves respond well to increased humidity before the rain. Their stems become very soft, and the wind can turn them upside down. But the best indicator is pine cones. The seeds are inside the cone, just under its scales. The pine needs to keep them as dry as possible so that the wind can carry the seeds far away and new trees can emerge from them. So when the pine senses rain approaching, it gives the order to close the cones. Then the scales close, protecting the seeds from the water. And instead of boring weather forecast hosts, you can just follow the animals and insects. Have you heard the crickets chirp? That will be your thermometer for today. 
Set the timer for 15 seconds and count how many times crickets chirp. Add 37 to that number and you get the outdoor temperature value in Fahrenheit degrees. All because air temperature directly affects crickets' metabolism. It can chirp slower and faster depending on how warm it is. So throw away your thermometer and get yourself a little friend. Now, if you don't like insects, look up into the sky for birds. If they're flying high, it'll be a clear and sunny day. But before it rains, air pressure prevents birds from flying high. You may see them flying in flocks very low, most likely looking for shelter. So even if the sky is clear, air pressure tells you that rain is coming. If you live near a river or lake, you can hear toads singing, although you can't quite make out the lyrics because it's in toad. They are especially loud before it rains hard. Toads, in general, love wet weather, so they just get excited. Rain is also the best time for females to lay eggs, so they scream loudly in search of a guy to wed. Ow! A mosquito has just bitten you. If mosquitoes are being especially aggressive, you better find a shelter fast. The insects are just trying to eat more before they have to starve during the storm. Also, the warm, humid air makes us sweat more, and we become even more attractive to mosquitoes. Insects also gather in swarms before a thunderstorm. They love the moisture in the air and start circling in a dance. But then they vanish into thin air. It means you have one hour left before heavy rain starts. To predict the weather for the next day, you need to watch the bees. If it rains tomorrow, the bees work overtime. They're pollinating flowers actively because they know they won't be able to leave the hive the next day because of the rain. Squirrels can predict the weather for the whole season. They usually stock up on food for the cold times. And if they start doing it early, it's going to be a tough winter. You can see squirrels running around looking for acorns. They hide them in the ground and run to find the next one. The squirrels often forget where they hid the food. These acorns turn into little sprouts, so we have many new trees, all thanks to squirrels. Animals can also predict disasters like earthquakes. Scientists once did a study in an area with frequent earthquakes in Europe. They put trackers on cows, dogs, and sheep. About 18,000 earthquakes occurred there during that time. Most of them were insignificant, but there were also 12 with a magnitude of 4 on the Richter scale. And each time before the earthquakes, researchers recorded strange animal behavior. It was as if they were trying to escape from the earthquake zone. Scientists believe animals can sense the ionization of the air before a disaster with their fur. Their good sense of smell also allows them to smell gas. It comes from moving deep underground and then trying to find its way out through small cracks in the surface. The first records of such animal behavior date back to ancient Greece. Cats, rats, snakes, and centipedes left their homes and fled to safety days before a major earthquake hit Greece. Some fish can predict the weather in the area. If sharks hang out near the shore, they're not necessarily looking for food. They may be hiding from a big storm at sea. The worst sign on the coastline is when all the water starts to go back abruptly. You can see the entire shoreline and even the fish and coral that are left on the land. Run away immediately, because soon a huge tsunami wave will come here and wash everything away. This is it! The end! You're packing up everything you can in whatever bags you have. Food, clothes, toiletries. The news in the background goes on, red alerts flashing all over the screen. You check your watch, and you know it's time. You haven't even finished packing yet. You rush out of your house and see everyone else lugging suitcases hurriedly. You get in your car and drive out as fast as you can, dodging all the people running around. You arrive at a secluded place in the woods. You've been working on your personal bunker for years. It's able to withstand the worst conditions. Tornadoes, hurricanes, volcanoes, and, hopefully, asteroids. You run to the bunker, hidden away next to some bushes and trees. There's no way anybody would know it's there. The door looks like the ones in bank vaults that contain huge piles of money. On the other side, a ladder that goes down 30 feet through a dark tunnel. The first thing you do is power up the place. It's all run on heavy-duty batteries, powered from solar panels above. As a backup, a fuel-powered generator. Hopefully you won't need to use it, but your life motto is, a person can't have too many fail-safes. The entire bunker is built from concrete and steel 
To maintain maximum durability, the walls are several feet thick. You can finally let out that sigh of relief because you made it just in time. You suddenly feel the ground vibrate, the walls tremble. Fear tightens in your chest when all the cabinet doors shake open and the stored food starts tumbling out. Did you miscalculate? Is this thing gonna hold up? The asteroid made contact, far from where you are, but it feels like it fell right on top of you. The sound is deafening and the shock waves seem to never end. The light flickers, the flying dust is hazing your vision and filling your lungs. You grab a mask with one final thought. This is it. The bunker's going to collapse. At least I tried. One month later. You're making breakfast after another sleepless night. Luckily, you stored more than enough food. And what variety? Canned tuna, corned beef, beans, sardines. Then there's the dried goods. Rice, powdered milk, pasta, noodles, and even some treats. Honey and chocolate. You also allowed yourself soda and juice, but water makes up most of your stored hydrators. This place has been and will continue to be your home for, who knows, weeks, months, years? The thought sends a chill down your spine. At least you're in an ideal location, far inland and away from any coast, so any possible tidal waves shouldn't have flooded your area. You can't imagine what it looks like up there. Please don't let it be like the dinosaurs part two. You need a distraction to take your thoughts away from the worst case scenario. You walk through your house like a real estate agent giving a tour to potential buyers. At the entrance, you have the living quarters, a couch and coffee table with some outdated magazines and board games. In front of you, a small flat screen TV with a DVD player. Sadly, no internet, but all those movies should keep you company. On a table nearby, you have a radio and telecommunications speaker that's like your ears and mouth to the outside. You also have your library with all sorts of books, classics, contemporary, and any genre, as long as it keeps your mind occupied. And if none of that helps you pass the time, there's always the video game consoles linked up to the TV. Ah yes, the gym area. It's modest, just a treadmill and some dumbbells. You try to get plenty of cardio and weightlifting in to keep yourself fit and healthy. Well, for someone living underground like a mole. Of course, you have the kitchen. It's got a good-sized mini fridge and a stainless steel sink with a bunch of cabinets storing all the goodies. You hook this place up with plumbing and pipes, bringing in clean drinking water. In case those stop working, you have water stored. The bathroom has a functioning toilet, sink, and a shower that's connected to the hot water pump. There's even a washer and dryer nearby. There's also a little workshop area. If something breaks, you can fix it here. You can also build some things out of scrap material, a chair or table if need be, a little figurine to put on the shelf and keep you company. Down some steps, you have another vital piece of the bunker, the greenhouse. It's all on lamps with artificial sunlight for obvious reasons. You'd be way worse off if you didn't have your fresh fruits and veggies. It's all self-sustaining too. Any rotten or bad crops go into making compost for the soil to keep it well nourished. You can forget about relying on meat for protein. Quinoa, beans, lentils, chickpeas, mushrooms, they get the job done. And just in case you're not getting every single mineral your body needs, you manage to stock up on multis. Vitamin D is a big one for life underground without the sun. Not far away from your little subterranean farm is your bedroom. It's got a queen-size bed, nightstand on the right, small wardrobe on the left. You don't have much variety in your attire, but Who's gonna notice if you wear the same outfit twice? The dust mites? You go down a ladder to find the generator room. There's a reason why it's further underground and sealed with soundproof material. The generator kicks in every now and then, and it's pretty noisy. It's also hooked up with the ventilation system, so the exhaust goes outside. Then there's the lung room. 
All these weird looking boxes are pumps that bring in oxygen from the outside world. But it has an advanced filtration system to clean the air before pumping it into your shelter. Down here is also the storage room. Every spare part of anything goes here. Extra couch, mattress, sinks. Even two freezers for those frozen goods, just in case. So, what's a day like in the bunker? First, whip up some breakfast and enjoy a cup of coffee. Then, you head over to the communication radio to hear if there's any news from the outside world. So far, there's been none. As soon as you're done, you head to the greenhouse for some quick farming. You really like being in there because it feels like you're outside enjoying nature. At least a little bit. You pick anything that's ripe and bring it into the kitchen for a wash. And wouldn't you know it, it's lunchtime. You prepare yourself a nice salad of cucumbers, tomatoes, and lettuce. Some beets on the side, pasta, and you eat it up. After lunch, you pop in a DVD you haven't watched in a while. After the movie, you go around and do a quick check on the oxygen levels and water. Today happens to be your scheduled generator checkup as well. You head down to the basement to glance at the fuel level and oxygen filters. All good so far. Though, the thought of an even more extended stay worries you. What if you run out of fuel? You spend a few hours in the workshop tinkering around. Currently, no fixer-upper projects, and you're not feeling especially creative today. So, you head to the gym. Today's leg day. Ugh, you dread it. Some things never change. Before you know it, it's time for dinner. You heat up some noodles and chill in the living room, listening to some tunes in the music player. This place cost you a little over $100,000, from digging up the site to construction and finally installing all the necessary systems needed for survival. And that's not including the extra food and personal activities for the bunker. Yes, you're lucky. All those luxuries make life good. Almost. Nothing new from the outside world after a whole month. You've always been a bit of an introvert, but this place is starting to push you a little. You're getting lonely. The sound of the radio snaps you out of your thoughts. Static? No, a muffled voice. Someone's trying to contact you. You bolt over to the communication radio, nearly tripping over your own feet from the shock. We made it! Ha! You're overcome with emotion! You've gotten pretty used to your life underground, but it's finally time to swing the door open and head out into the world. Something interesting has recently happened in South Dakota. It was all over the internet, so perhaps you already know about it. In July of 2022, the sky in this state suddenly turned green. So what happened there? Was it caused by a human or by nature? Let's find out. Tuesday, July 5th, 2022. Shortly after a heavy storm, the sky over South Dakota in the US was still overcast. Locals finally went outside and saw that the sky had an intense dark green hue, and they'd never seen anything like that before. People said that it looked like something straight up from science fiction or even a horror movie. Unsurprisingly, South Dakotans immediately started spreading the news all over social media. People shared their beautiful, yet very eerie, pictures on Twitter. They showed the sky over the city of Sioux Falls and a few other towns. Even though it may look like something supernatural, in reality, this is not a terrifying phenomenon at all. It's a simple play of the light and the atmosphere. Something like this happens quite rarely and usually means that really bad weather is approaching. And that's also true to what happened in South Dakota. Just before people started sharing photos, a thunderstorm swept through the town of Sioux Falls. This was confirmed by the US Weather Service. This hurricane was terrible. The wind speed was about 100 miles per hour. According to the Buford scale on wind speeds, this is the fastest and most destructive storm. There are only 12 numbers on this scale, and the maximum wind strength starts at 73 miles per hour. But why isn't this all over the news then? Well, because it's kind of a usual thing for the residents. 
thunderstorms occur very often in the United States, especially in the warmer months. And one out of 10 such thunderstorms can become something serious, like a tornado. This one wasn't an exception. It was the so-called Derreco storm. Derreco is very widespread and long-lived. It's actually a combination of a fast-moving group of severe thunderstorms and downpours. People often say that a Derreco is as strong as a tornado. Still, there's a difference between them. A tornado is a vortex, a rotating column of air. It's usually about 500 feet in diameter, although sometimes its width can reach up to 2.5 miles. I don't envy those who would stumble upon that. But the main point is that they rotate. The wind moves very fast in a circle, near some invisible center. A Derreco is a strong thunderstorm, or a system of strong thunderstorms with straight line winds. In other words, it doesn't spin. Instead, the Derreco chooses a point somewhere and simply runs to it, like a very motivated marathon runner. If we compare a Derreco to an ordinary tornado, the latter has six levels of strength, from 40 to 380 miles per hour. So a Derreco is kind of like a small, average level one to two tornado. Usually, its speed is within the range of 73 to 113 miles per hour. And in both cases, they can be accompanied by severe thunderstorms, lightning, and rain. But still, these are different things. A storm becomes a Derreco if the damage trail left by it exceeds 240 miles and if the wind speed is at least 58 miles per hour. It's quite difficult to predict. It can form even on a clear day when meteorologists don't even anticipate any storms. And then the winds appear suddenly. It's so surprising that they may even feel explosive. But the National Weather Service tries to warn people at least half an hour or an hour before this happens, so that residents have time to prepare and hide. It wasn't any different this time. The storm swept through almost all of South Dakota, as well as the states of Minnesota and Iowa. The consequences were quite serious. More than 30,000 people were left without electricity. Fortunately, people were fine. That's because the locals are pretty used to Derecos. However, the green sky is something different. It became a very unusual sight for the locals. Everyone was wondering why it happened. Was it a bad sign or a normal weather phenomenon? Well, to be honest, scientists don't have an exact explanation. But although there are only assumptions, they sound pretty convincing. A green sky is a very rare phenomenon. Most scientists think that this happens when a powerful storm approaches the area before sunset or sunrise. Then the sky will turn green in this area. NBC meteorologist Bill Cairns, who once faced a similar event himself, suggests that the green sky appeared because of the huge hail before the storm. First, let's talk about why the sky looks blue or any other shade, depending on its mood. In short, the sun simultaneously carries all the rays of the color spectrum. It may seem white to us in total, but it actually has all the colors at the same time. However, these color waves all have different lengths. For example, blue rays are shorter than the other ones. They jump away from the air molecules better than the red waves, so they reach us faster. Because of this, on a regular clear day, the sky seems blue. At the same time, red and orange color waves are very long and move slower, so they're usually left behind. But when the sun goes below the horizon or rises, the rays' directions change, and these waves reach us better. It all means that even if the sunrises and sunsets seem red and orange to us, in fact, there are still blue and green waves among them. But they have to bounce off something to reach us faster and become stronger than the red rays. Have you guessed what I'm getting at? This is where the water comes into play. Clouds are made up of water droplets. When they become large enough, 
but don't fall yet. For example, due to strong winds, they affect how the light behaves in the sky. Large, heavy storms mostly consist of water and hail. And water reflects blue and green rays best of all. That's exactly the reason why the water in rivers and lakes seems bluish green to us. Although in reality, it's transparent. And yeah, algae matter too. So, there are a couple of key factors why the sky may turn green. First off, the sun should be at the horizon level. Another factor is that while the storm clouds are approaching, they shouldn't cover the sky completely. There still must be a little room for the sun rays. Then, barely noticeable blue rays jump up to storm clouds. They're repelled by water droplets and hail. Mixing with the red sunset, they turn into a bright green light. And this green light is spreading all over the sky. That's why in most of these cases, when the sky turns green, people can only see it in the evenings. Yeah, it can also happen in the middle of the day. But since the conditions are already quite specific, seeing something like that during the day is even rarer. Still, if you see a green sky, you don't need to panic. It doesn't necessarily mean that a terrible storm is approaching. The chances are high though, but still, it's not a rule. It can be just heavy rain or a heavy hail. In other words, if you see a green sky, then you'd better hide and hide your car. However, if you were lucky enough to see the stunning sky from the comfort of your own home, it's indeed very exciting. If you get a glimpse of something like that, just know that you had a chance to experience something very rare and special. Some people said it was the most incredible thing they had ever seen. Ah, beautiful! You're walking with your friend and look up at the sky. The sun looks a bit different today, like it has some kind of ring around it, a rainbow type thing. Huh? Hey, look at that! Your friend pulls his head up out of his phone. You shouldn't look directly into the stop everything, he says. It's a sun halo. We need to find shelter now, unless you have the world's biggest umbrella on you. A sun's halo is nature's sign that there's a snow or rainstorm on its way. It's caused by clouds that are made of bazillions of small ice crystals flying around 20,000 feet. Sunlight goes through those crystals, which causes the light to split and refract, like when there's a rainbow. Now, don't look at the sun halo directly. It's going to be tempting because it's not something you see every day. Plus, it's really beautiful. But ultraviolet light can burn the exposed tissue of your retina and cause serious damage. So, not worth it. Grab some sunglasses, and you're good to go. This phenomenon lasts about 40 minutes. These clouds are the same ones that can cause a spooky ring around the moon at night sometimes. Nature sends early signs of disasters in many ways. J-shaped trees means there's a landslide coming. Since the ground is moving slowly, the trees grow into the super selfieable shape. Try to find a flat area and avoid going near any trees, unless you have superhuman strength. You're on a nice walk on the beach. Sand, sun, not a cloud in the sky. Then, out of nowhere, you see the ocean going back away from the shore. Suddenly, you can even see bits of coral, small fish, and other random small sea animals. That's a good sign to leave. There might be a tsunami on the way. A tsunami is formed when there's an earthquake underwater, and it can hit the coast at 500 miles per hour. It's mostly a Pacific Ocean thing, but why risk it? If there's a channel of choppy water on the beach, stay away. There might be a rip current under the surface that can be extremely dangerous. Sometimes, waves hit the shore in a weird way, which forms these rip currents. You might see a strange gap in the waves. Or you might notice random bits of seaweed going in all different directions. If you don't ever find yourself caught in a rip current, try to stay afloat and don't waste your energy swimming against the current. Yell out for help and try to float your way along the beach. Once you break out of the channel, swim diagonally to the shore. If you find yourself in the ocean and see a group of sharks swimming, okay, this scenario doesn't sound good either way. Well, the good news is they're not necessarily coming for you. The bad news? The sharks might be trying to escape from a huge tropical storm or even a hurricane. 
Sharks can sense these things, so when nature gets angry, they group together and swim deep under the surface to get to safety. You probably shouldn't follow them. Good luck! The golden rule since ancient times, follow the animals. Insects, rats, and snakes leave their homes a couple of days before really big earthquakes. Scientists can't track or really explain how they know it's coming. It seems animals really can sense earthquakes. Maybe because they feel those smaller initial shock waves that we don't even notice. What if you see animals running towards you? Well, that could mean you're about to get eaten for breakfast. Or it means there's a wildfire behind them. Amphibians like frogs, toads, and salamanders try to protect themselves by burrowing down into the ground. Others just run. Before you start running alongside them, check to see if you can see smoke. You don't want to sprint flat out for nothing. Well, it's not just animals. We can spot warning signs, too. For example, if you notice your hair suddenly starts to stand on end and your jewelry starts to buzz, take shelter right away. Lightning might be about to strike somewhere nearby. If you're outside and can't run into a house, make sure not to stand near any tall structures. Lie flat on the ground. Be near water. Seek shelter under an isolated tree or stand in an open space. And don't stand on top of the Empire State Building. That thing gets zapped hundreds of times a year. Do you like skiing? It's all fun and games until all you can see is white. Avalanches can move up to 80 miles an hour, so watch for some warning signs. Does it feel hollow when you walk in the snow? Are there cracks around your feet? Can you see a huge avalanche coming? Time to go! Sometimes a storm mixes its blue light with the red light from the sun, and you get a pretty impressive green. Enjoy it from a safe distance, preferably indoors. This super tall thundercloud usually means you're about to get smashed by hail, or worse, a tornado. Find cover somewhere, like in an underground parking lot or a basement. It might be a bit embarrassing if you're wrong, though. Okay, we know volcanoes can be dangerous, but the lakes near them? Is anything not a sign of danger? Lakes that are near something boiling hot that never cools, so volcanoes, are like wildly shaken soda cans just about to burst. The magma that's underground actually pushes carbon dioxide into the bottom of the lake, and that gas stays there, waiting. Then, even something boring like rain can disturb the lake a little too much and bam! Or boom! (laughs) You get the picture. Diving, swimming, snorkeling, the sea can be amazing, but it's pretty unpredictable. When two wave currents run into each other, they can create a cross sea. It looks pretty cool from far away, but it can be really dangerous for swimmers, surfers, or even ships. There's a strong current roaming around under the surface. You're walking on the beach, apparently every good story starts like this, and all of a sudden, woo, a cave! How cool is this? You should probably go in there, explore a bit, and no. If there's a full moon out, you might not be able to get out of that cave. A full moon affects the tide and makes it lower than usual. That cave might be more accessible, but instead of an exciting adventure, you could end up trapped in there until the next full moon. Bring a big lunch. A wall cloud is one of those things you're both excited and scared to see. Scared because you don't know what it is. Excited because, well, how often do you see something like that? Whatever you feel, tell your legs to start running. During a thunderstorm, these wall clouds sit lower than anything else and can be up to 5 miles long. And if they start spinning, well, Dorothy ended up in Oz. Who knows where you'll end up? It's 2009 in Italy. A man was hanging out in his kitchen. Then he saw some flickering lights. He knew just what to do. He moved his family to a safe place. A couple of seconds later, a massive earthquake hit the whole region. His family survived thanks to his quick reaction. He knew these flickering lights were actually a sign of an upcoming earthquake. People have been seeing these mysterious lights for ages. Some thought it was some kind of sign coming from space. Scientists never used to take them seriously. But after the invention of photography, more and more evidence of these strange lights appeared. Soon, they realized the connection. The lights appear, and pretty soon, the earthquake hits. 
After a bit of digging around, they actually found some records of these earthquake lights from hundreds of years ago. There were bluish flames coming out of the ground right before an earthquake. Ooh, creepy. Oh, ocean, come on, not you again. Okay, but just one more. If you see the oceans turned all reddish-brown, don't go in the water or anywhere near it. This red tide is caused by toxic algae and is something you can find all over the world. That toxic algae can be there even if the ocean's a normal color. Getting that stuff all over you can cause some health issues. Rinse yourself off in fresh water as fast as you can. You know, they even wrote a holiday song about it. Algae home for Christmas. No, really. Look at this ominous dark cloud. Is it rotating? What on earth is happening here? What you see is called a supercell. It's a storm, often a thunderstorm, that contains an updraft rotating about a vertical axis. That's why they're also called rotating thunderstorms. There are actually four types of thunderstorms. Single cell, multi-cell, squall line, and supercell. Out of them all, supercells are the rarest and the most severe. They're typically isolated from other thunderstorms and last for two to four hours. Supercells are very common for the Great Plains of the United States. In particular, the area known as Tornado Alley. But they can occur in other parts of the world too. For example, in Europe, Argentina, Uruguay, and southern Brazil. These storms can be any size, large and small, high or low topped. Supercells are also associated with the most severe tornadoes, even though not every supercell can create one. These storms usually produce great amounts of torrential rainfall and hail, and are accompanied by powerful winds and downbursts. Downbursts are powerful winds that come down from a thunderstorm. Once they hit the ground, they spread out very quickly. These winds are dangerous, since they can cause a lot of damage. Even though they're often confused with tornadoes, downbursts are a totally different phenomenon. Let's have a look at how a downburst forms. At the beginning of a thunderstorm, there's a powerful updraft. That's why the cloud grows vertically and hailstones and raindrops start forming inside. The storm matures, and the updraft keeps feeding the cloud with unstable, moist air. Hailstones and raindrops are now big and heavy enough to fall to the ground. But sometimes, the updraft is so strong that it suspends huge amounts of hail and rain in the upper part and the center of the storm. But let's say some dry air gets into the middle and lower parts of the storm it can cause a downburst. When it happens, all that amount of rain and hail from the upper part of the storm dashes toward the ground, dragging along a lot of air. All this mass gains speed, and when the downburst eventually reaches the ground, it's like a stream of water coming out of a faucet and hitting the sink. It spreads in all directions at an incredible speed, sometimes more than 100 miles per hour. But what you might most likely come across is called a microburst. It means that those terrible winds are confined to an area smaller than 2.5 miles across. While speaking about tornadoes, I can't but mention volcanic tornadoes. They're possibly one of the scariest natural phenomena. When a volcano erupts, it throws hot rock and ash high into the atmosphere. As for lava pieces and hot gases, they travel down the volcano's slope. When this flow is moving down, some of the gases trapped inside begin to rise and spin at the same time. They get squeezed by the surrounding air, which makes them spin faster and faster. That's how a volcanic tornado gets born. On the bright side, this phenomenon has a very short lifespan. If you ever see a tight burning column of air, that's a fire tornado a creepy combination of whirlwind sounds and scorching inferno. This phenomenon is also called a fire twister or fire whirl. This dangerous natural phenomenon mostly occurs during wildfires. While burning, such fires create a big area of boiling hot air just above the ground. And when this scorching air gets mixed with the cooler air higher up, it results in a whirlwind that churns up burning debris and flames. 
the most powerful fire nados can stretch hundreds of feet into the sky. Another dangerous natural phenomenon is called a snow squall. If you get caught in a snow squall while driving, you won't find a safe place on a highway because this is an intense, but thankfully pretty short, period of heavy snowfall that comes along with powerful gusty winds and sometimes even lightning. People have known about this phenomenon for quite some time, but the term itself, as well as the warning associated with this danger, appeared only in 2018. Another danger of snow squalls is something called a flash freeze. Come to think of it, it makes sense. Rapidly dropping temperatures and freshly fallen snow glaze highways very fast. This makes controlling your car almost impossible. The next curious phenomenon I'm going to talk about happens extremely rarely and is still poorly understood. It's usually not something big and turbulent. Dust devils can be tiny and vanish within minutes. They've got lots of names, whirlwinds, dusters, and sand spouts. Dust devils look like funnels of sand spiraling upward from the ground. But unlike their terrifying relatives, tornadoes, these babies are normally nothing to worry about. And still, according to the definition, dust devils fall in the same category as hurricanes and tornadoes. All three natural phenomena feature a column of air kind of spinning around an invisible pole. They're all formed during the collision of different types of air, moist versus dry, or hot versus cold, and so on. But hurricanes usually form over a body of water where cold air slides under warm air. Tornadoes spiral down from the sky when hot air rises through a mass of cold air, and dust devils form on the ground. Even though we call them dust devils, they can actually swirl any loose debris. The main criteria, the pieces have to be small and light enough to be lifted by a fast-moving vortex. By the way, do you know that some clouds can predict extreme weather? For example, shelf clouds. They look like something from a sci-fi movie. They form when warm and moist air gets caught in a thunderstorm updraft. These ominous clouds most often mean a storm is coming. Those huge white lumps over your head are called mammatus clouds. They can make you believe the sky is falling. Most clouds form when air rises into the atmosphere. But mammatus clouds appear when moist and cool air goes down and mixes with dry air. The result is these unique puffed rice clouds. By the way, if you see this phenomenon in the sky, bad weather is just around the corner. Morning glory clouds are extremely rare and harmless. They look like massive tubes stretching across the sky. They can snake for more than 600 miles, sitting relatively low. Most researchers agree that these clouds appear when an updraft squeezes through the cloud. This creates the signature rolling appearance. The cool air at the back of the cloud makes it sink downward. The best, but not the only, place to see the morning glory is Australia's Gulf of Carpentaria. If you decide to travel there to see these clouds, choose a period from late September to early November. Ever seen huge round disks in the sky? Most likely, those were lenticular clouds. They usually form over large and high places, like mountains or hills. When strong wind bumps into some barrier, this creates an air wave. The air kind of wraps around the obstacle. And the higher the barrier is, the colder the air that is rising over it becomes. At some point, the moisture it contains turns into water droplets. And they form these unusual clouds. Lenticular clouds can look like waves, a pizza, or even a stack of pancakes. And these clouds, on the contrary, form low in the sky and after some bad weather. Rainbow clouds appear on top of puffy low-altitude clouds after thunderstorms. They usually hover at the height of around 6,000 feet. When the water vapor they contain condenses, the resulting droplets act like prisms. This forms multicolored caps over the clouds. And a pretty scary bonus fact for you. One of the most common causes of wildfires is lightning from thunderstorms. But have you ever heard of a wildfire that triggered a thunderstorm? Well, now you know. It happened on May 11, 2018, 
not far from Amarillo, Texas. Then, the super-powerful Mallard Fire not only created a massive dense cloud high in the air, but its heat also caused a violent thunderstorm that later dumped tons of quarter-sized hailstones 60 miles away in Wheeler County, Texas. Let's test to see how many spiral-shaped objects you can find around you right now. I'll bet there's more than you think. A spiral may be hidden in the flower petals of your houseplants. One might be staring at you from that seashell you brought home from your last trip to the beach. If none of these objects sound familiar, you might want to head over to the mirror and turn to the side a bit. In case you haven't noticed yet, even our own ears are shaped like a spiral. Why does Mother Nature seem to have such a preference for this shape? Many theories wish to explain this weird behavior. One of them is based on the Fibonacci sequence. This Italian mathematician didn't really care much for spirals initially. He was studying rabbits when he came up with this theory. Fibonacci came up with the sequence as a solution to a problem involving the growth of a population of rabbits. Let's recreate his experiment. If you put a pair of rabbits in an enclosed space, how many pairs of rabbits will you find there after a year? To solve this problem, Fibonacci proposed some conditions for his theoretical experiment. That all rabbits are born as a pair, one male, one female. Also, the rabbits can start reproducing after one month. More so, each pair of rabbits produces one pair of offspring each month. And lastly, none of the rabbits kicks the bucket at the end of the year. Now, using these assumptions, Fibonacci noticed the following sequence. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, and so on. The first two numbers in the sequence, 1, 1, represent the initial pair of rabbits. The next number, 2, represents the number of pairs of rabbits after the first month one pair of the initial rabbits plus one pair of offspring. The fourth number, three, represents the number of pairs after the second month, two pairs of the initial rabbits plus one pair of offspring, and so on. He soon noticed that his series is made out of numbers in which each number is the sum of the previous two numbers. A lot of other mathematicians have looked at this sequence over the years. They were soon surprised to discover that this system was found in many natural structures, such as the arrangement of leaves on a stem and the arrangements of seeds on a sunflower. If you don't understand why it is so, then grab a piece of paper and a pen. Together, let's try to draw the Fibonacci spiral. You'll have to start with a small circle at the center of your page and then draw larger circles around it without lifting the pen from the paper using the numbers from the Fibonacci sequence. For example, the first circle is 0 units wide, the second circle is 1 unit wide, the third circle is 1 unit wide, and so on. As you keep adding more circles, they will fit together perfectly to form a spiral shape. The spiral gets bigger and bigger, but it always follows the same pattern based on the Fibonacci sequence. Another famous spiralist was a man named James Bell Pettigrew. He was a Scottish naturalist that became fascinated by the mystery of the spiral shape, which he noticed almost everywhere in nature. He studied it at all scales, from giant nebulae in space to tiny molecules. Despite his research, he couldn't figure out where the spiral came from. He was sure that it couldn't be just a physical thing, and he believed that organs and plants and animals are not only shaped like spirals, but they also work in a spiral way. At the center of lifetime work on this unique shape was the human heart. Pettigrew believed that the heart's spiral structure was the mystery of all mysteries. He also thought this shape was to blame for both its muscular contractions and how the blood seemed to travel within our mighty tickers. The reason why the spiral seems to be everywhere might be really simple. Efficiency. Take a look at the basic sunflower, for example. It figured out a way to display its seeds so that it could expose them to the sun equally, without wasting any space and without being limited in their growth. Spiral stairs are another great example, too. They just work better. You find it easier to climb them, and they should take less space than the usual ones. We also might be more inclined to notice this shape more than others. 
as because a spiral shape or its proportions is more aesthetically pleasing to the human eye. It's the reason why interior designers, artists, or illustrators often use these principles in their work. The spiral symbol is also the oldest symbol found in every civilized continent. Some historians believe that the spiral in Asian art may represent the sun as it has been found on roof tiles from the Tang Dynasty near the ancient city of Chang'an. It is also often found at burial sites, and scientists believe it to represent the circle of life, how we pass on and somehow be reborn. This is probably because in some ancient civilizations, people believed that the sun was born each day, extinguished itself each night, and was reborn the next day. You might have also stumbled upon the spiral as a symbol of hypnosis and dizziness. There's no real evidence that you can hypnotize someone by making them stare into a spiral for a certain time. But its effects on our abilities to focus and our optic nerves are significant. After you've stared at a spinning spiral for quite some time, you'll notice how objects either get smaller or bigger, depending on the direction of the spiral. It's easy to understand why some experience this sensation as hypnotizing. One of the most distinctive features of DNA is its spiral shape. It's also called a double helix. The double helix is formed when two strands of DNA twist around each other, like a ladder being twisted into a spiral shape. This spiral shape is important for many reasons. First, the spiral shape allows DNA to be compact and efficient. The double helix can pack a lot of genetic information into a small space, making it possible for cells to store vast amounts of genetic material in a small area. Second, the spiral shape allows DNA to be flexible and respond to changes in our environment. Because the double helix is made up of two strands that can move relative to each other, our DNA can change its shape. Finally, the spiral shape of DNA allows it to interact with other molecules in the cell. Now, let's look at the big picture. I mean, the biggest of them all, that of the galaxies found in our universe. They're also shaped like a spiral due to their rotation and the presence of dark matter. As the galaxy spins, the stars and gas clouds within the galaxy move in a circular direction around its center. This movement creates a spiral shape as the stars and gas clouds are drawn toward the center of the whole system. Additionally, the presence of dark matter, which is a type of matter that does not interact with light, creates gravitational forces that help to shape the galaxy into a spiral. But you don't need to look that far to understand why spirals are important. Your handy corkscrew is shaped like a spiral too, because it makes it easier for you to open the wine bottle. That screw you drilled into the wall to hang a picture? Also a spiral. It helps it with some added grip and stability. Got a notebook on your desk? Those pages might be held together by a spiraled wire. It makes it easier for you to browse the notebook without damaging the pages. Even your hair strands might have a curled shape. The curlier the hair, the drier it will be. It means it will get sebum from the scalp down on the strand slower, making it easier to maintain and clean. And before I spiral out of control, (laughs) we're done here. Why do we love Saturn so much? Right, because we love its amazing rings. The planet stands out in the solar system because of them. The major rings have a diameter of 170,000 miles, yet their thickness does not exceed 330 feet. Saturn's slowest outermost ring spins at about 37,000 miles per hour. It's slower than the rotation of Saturn itself. But did you know that Saturn was ringless for most of its history? Let's find out how they were formed. Using Cassini's final plunge into the planet, researchers could estimate the ring's mass, 33 billion billion pounds. Further, they have determined that the rings were between 10 to 100 million years old, much younger than the planet itself. The thing is that the rings only look solid. They are made of billions of rock and ice chunks. They are primarily tiny ones, looking like grains of sugar to those as large as a house, or even as mountains. 
the innermost chunks of ice and rock shoot through space at about 52,000 miles per hour. There are mysterious spokes in its rings. It seems they form and disperse within a couple of hours. And these spokes might consist of electrically charged sheets of tiny particles formed when small meteors hit the rings, or maybe electron beams from Saturn's lightning. One theory says Saturn's rings have formed all that extra material that remained after Saturn began, which is a material that couldn't create a moon. There's also a theory that says there was Theia, a Mars-sized planet that collided with Earth about 4.5 billion years ago. Lighter crust parts ended up in space during the impact, whereas its denser core stayed behind. But in the case of Saturn, all that debris perhaps didn't put a new moon together, but it formed rings many people today recognize this planet for. Another theory is that rings formed from dust and debris of a moon that ended up destroyed by this big impact, maybe by an asteroid or comet. Or perhaps the rings are there because once a moon fell apart because of the tidal forces coming from its parent planet itself. If these rings formed at the same period as Saturn did, they would have had more than 4 billion years to collect a bit of debris and dirt coming from micrometeorite collisions. But these rings mainly consist of water ice, no dirt at all, which means they're younger than expected. And the nature of this ring system tells us a thing or two about Saturn's fuzzy inside. Fuzzy means its core is like sludge. The helium and hydrogen in Saturn mix with more and more rock and ice over time, the closer you go to the planet's core. It's similar to what you see in our oceans. The deeper you go, the level of saltiness increases. But the rings may disappear in the far future. Rings are generally more common than we think. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune all have their own ring system. But not every planet has the same ones. Saturn has a fascinating halo, and definitely the most spectacular rings, true. Others mostly have rings made of dust and rocky particles, and not just planets. Other space bodies can have rings, like the asteroid called Chiricla. But even though the gas giants of our solar system have rings, rocky or so-called terrestrial ones don't. And one theory says it might have been that way because gas planets in the outer area of the solar system protected those rocky ones that formed in the inner solar system from all those collisions that possibly could have formed rings around them. Or it could be because gas giants are way bigger and their enormous volume allows them to have a ring system that can remain stable. And what if Earth had rings in the past too? Maybe in the time of the big collision when our moon could have been formed. Now to some more cool things happening in our solar system. Pluto, a tiny dwarf planet at the edge of our solar system. Also the one we used to call a planet has a pretty bizarre atmosphere. No one expected to see a haze there go as high as 1,000 miles. That means it rises higher above the surface of the atmosphere of our home planet. And the atmosphere on Pluto has around 20 layers. They're more compact and way cooler than scientists expected. And tons of nitrogen gas escape Pluto by the hour. But the dwarf planet still finds a way to constantly create new supplies of all the nitrogen it had lost. One theory says it probably produces these supplies through geological activity. Our moon is pretty peaceful, but that's not something we can say for Io, one of Jupiter's moons. This one has hundreds of volcanoes. It's the moon with the most volcanic activity in our solar system. Io sends plumes of sulfur up to an incredible 190 miles into its atmosphere. Its volcanoes emit many particles and gases into the space right next to Jupiter every single second. Its eruptive activities happen because of Jupiter's mighty gravitational forces and magnetic field. The insides of Io tense up and relax all the time, depending on how close or far away it is from Jupiter. And that's why it generates enough energy to have such an eruptive nature. Speaking of volcanoes, Mars has one larger than the whole state of Hawaii. At first, you'd probably say it's a quiet and peaceful planet. But once upon a time, enormous volcanoes dominated its surface. Yup, that includes a well-known Olympus Mons, the largest volcano ever found in our entire solar system, 374 miles across, comparable to the size of Arizona. Olympus Mons is 16 miles high, three times the height of our tallest mountain, Mount Everest. And by its volume, 
This volcano is 100 times bigger than the largest one on Earth. Mars can have such big volcanoes because its gravity is significantly weaker than the one on our home planet. Also, the crust on Earth moves all the time, unlike the Martian crust. Do you know how the Hawaiian Islands formed? A hot spot in the mantle created a chain of volcanoes in the crust floating above it. A Martian volcano may grow bigger because its surface isn't moving, so a volcano could build up for a longer time in just one spot. Miranda is one of the most bizarre moons in the outer part of our solar system. It's a shadowy moon that orbits Uranus, with many craters, sharp ridges, and similar disruptions on its surface. Usually, this type of relief tells a certain area used to have a lot of volcanic activities. But that wasn't the case with Miranda. Also, this moon is way too small to generate tectonic activities, another element that could form this type of surface. One theory says the gravitational force from Uranus could have caused the push-pull action, something that made all these bumps on Miranda's surface. We'll have to send another spacecraft to find out what was happening there. We are all made of stardust. 97% of atoms we're made of are the same as the material our galaxy consists of. The building blocks of life is a term we use for a group of elements that are vital for life on Earth. And stars have these elements too, but in different proportions. For instance, we are 65% oxygen by our mass, whereas elements we measure in space, like the spectra of stars, have less than 1% of oxygen. So, Mercury is already the smallest in our solar system in the planet category, excluding some other bodies like the dwarf planet Pluto. And now it looks like it's still shrinking. It's the second densest after our planet, but it's getting denser over time. Researchers thought the Earth was the only planet in our solar system with tectonic activities for a long time. And now we know Mercury is tectonically active too. Messenger spacecraft managed to map the whole planet. Scientists realized the planet is full of fault scarps, some cliff-like landforms. Since these are relatively small, they're probably young, and Mercury is still contracting even 4.5 billion years after our solar system was formed. Now, let's pretend that humanity faces a huge threat from outer space. So, we'll imagine that a uh, giant planet-eating octopus comes to our solar system to eat uh, Venus, Mars, Earth, um, Jupiter, and other planets, except Saturn. Therefore, people decide to move to the big planet with giant rings. Fortunately, they already have cool technologies that allow them to make such trips. So, we get into giant ships, take off, and fly to Saturn. Life on the planet itself is impossible because it has no solid ground. The ship won't be able to land there. This is a giant gas ball that is nine times wider than Earth. To compare their sizes, look at a five-cent coin and a baseball. And the planet's atmosphere consists mainly of hydrogen and helium. So if the ship starts to land, it'll never reach solid ground. And the lower it goes, the higher the pressure it will experience. Eventually, the ship will just be crushed. Therefore, we have only one choice, the rings of Saturn. They're made up of giant, medium-sized, and tiny particles of ice and rock flying around the gas giant at tremendous speed. They were formed from comets flying by. Saturn's gravity knocked these celestial bodies off their course and crushed them with its pressure. Fragments of these comets began to accumulate around Saturn, forming rings. Now, some of these particles fly faster, some are slower. The closest to the planet is the D ring. It's followed by rings C and B. Then there's a large gap called Cassini division. Rings A, F, G, and E come after. This classification is very convenient for creating a ring map. So, people approach the rings, but don't dare to land on them. First, they send test capsules with robots to scout the area. The robots choose a suitable location on the E-ring. In fact, the distance between the rocks is quite large, and the ship can easily fly there. There are tiny particles, huge rocks the size of houses, and comets the size of a whole mountain. The first robot flies up to a large rock at high speed. At this moment, a baseball-sized stone pierces the robot's body. Another robot gets smashed between two colliding boulders. The third robot gets caught in a rain of sharp icicles and breaks. 
People have big engineering workshops on their ships, so they build new capsules and new robots. This time, they're made of more durable materials, so the robots reach a big rock again. A few particles crash into them, but don't break through the armor. The machine set up a small station on a flying rock where people can live. But after a couple of hours, a big chunk of asteroid smashes the station. Well, seems like we need another strategy. Giant ships scan the entire area of the E-ring and calculate the trajectories of billions of stones. After lengthy calculations, people finally find the perfect places in the middle of this chaos that will stay intact for a long time. They land on these large rocks in their capsules and begin to settle down. They build stations and small houses and install powerful batteries on them. Saturn is located at a distance of 9.5 astronomical units from the Sun. One unit is the distance from the Sun to Earth. So Saturn is a pretty cold place. That's why there's so much ice flying around it. But how to get the energy to heat it all up? There's too little of it on large ships. Besides, solar panels are ineffective here because of the great distance from the Sun. Therefore, scientists create a way to generate kinetic energy from flying stones. It's like a windmill. When the wind drives the fans, these movements are converted into energy. So engineers build panels that collect power from the moving stones. But it doesn't slow the speed of rocks down because Saturn's gravity continues to move them. Thus, people receive a source of almost limitless energy. Some space stations have plants and trees that produce oxygen through photosynthesis. Only instead of sunlight, they get energy from ultraviolet. Then, people fill large tanks with oxygen and carry them to their homes. People begin to occupy the adjacent rings. You don't need a lot of fuel to get from one place to another. You can land on a rock, calculate its route, and wait for it to bring you to the needed point. Then, you can move to another one, and so on, until you reach your destination. More and more people leave their ships and move to the rings. It seems that life is getting better. But then psychological problems begin. Constant movement in the vacuum of space drives everyone mad. Imagine living on a carousel that never stops. You can't walk to the store whenever you want because it always flies away. No one can go out for a walk, even in a spacesuit, because there's a chance to come across a rock flying at high speed. You can't plan anything because, at the moment, your plans can be ruined by a giant piece of ice. Computers don't help either. They can't calculate the trajectories of all space bodies. Rocks tend to break and split into hundreds of smaller ones. Also, new comets fly by and also become part of the rings. All this creates uncertainty and causes a sense of anxiety in people. Besides, it's dark, cold, and very lonely on the rings. Now think about building a base on a space object. But your best friend lands on another one a few miles away. Then, a giant icicle crashes into his rock and increases its speed. And a few days later, your friend is too far away. And it happens all the time. The only way to change your life is to settle on one of Saturn's moons. The planet has 83 of them. People have already confirmed and named 63, and the existence of 20 others has yet to be confirmed. They're all like different worlds. Some of them may be habitable. And the best candidate among them is Titan. There may be water on it, and its atmospheric pressure is only one and a half times greater than Earth's. Its atmosphere consists of nitrogen and a little methane, forming carbon smog in Titan's upper layers. For this reason, we can't study this moon from Earth. But the coolest thing is that Titan flies outside the rings of Saturn. This means people can lead a quiet life there. There's also satellite Phoebe covered with craters like our moon. This giant celestial body looks more like a gigantic meteorite. People have a lot of choices of where to start a new life. During a couple of hundred years spent on ships near Saturn, humanity would learn everything about its satellites. But why did they try to live on the rings? Why didn't they land on one of the moons from the very beginning? Because, well, then this video would be less fun and a whole lot shorter. But what if we were initially born inside the rings of Saturn? Let's say a massive meteorite with frozen water got caught by the planet's gravity. 
there were the simplest life forms inside the ice. And then, this life began to acquire more developed forms. Imagine that the large rock managed to remain untouched for hundreds of millions of years. And during this time, humans appeared. But of course, they would be very different there. Firstly, they wouldn't experience gravitational forces. This would make them taller, but weaker. People's skin would be pale because of the lack of light, but very hardy thanks to cold temperatures. Particles of ice and grains of sand flying in space would roughen people's skin. In such biological armor, without gravity, they would jump from one rock to another in search of food and water. And by the way, that would be the main problem. How would people survive without oxygen in the vacuum of space? Where would they get their food? Saturn's rings are a pretty lifeless and dangerous place. If there are not even the simplest forms of life there, then how could such a complex one as the human appear? Therefore, even in theory, the appearance of people would be impossible there. I'm about to introduce you to a place where the laws of physics take a vacation. Welcome to the mystery spot where you can witness all kinds of implausible things that will leave you scratching your head in disbelief. Don't worry, it's not sorcery or witchcraft. It's just some clever optical illusions that mess with your brain and make you question reality. Back in the day when the Great Depression was hitting hard, people needed some fun distractions. That's how the entertainment industry gave birth to the concept of mystery spots. One of the most famous mystery spots is the one near Santa Cruz, California. The name is all intrigue and mystique, isn't it? Once you step inside, you'll see people standing upright on a slanted floor or at impossible angles on a flat surface. You'll see a ball rolling up a ramp defying gravity and logic. It's like being in a fun house but without creepy clowns. The site is known for its gravity-defying demonstrations, which appear to bend the laws of physics, both on the short uphill walk and inside the wooden building on the site. Misperceptions of the height and orientation of objects occur here. These visual illusions include balls rolling uphill and people leaning farther than normally possible without falling down. Psychologists at Berkeley state that all of the misperceptions stem from the simple fact that the house is slanted at a 20 degree angle. The next stop is again in the USA, but this time at Hoover Dam in Nevada. Here gravity seems to play with us too. Try this experiment if you ever happen to go there. Pour water from a bottle over the dam. You will witness that instead of going down, the water will start flowing upward. The reason behind this is a very powerful updraft that the structure of the dam creates. In other words, the water gets carried upward by the wind. This trick is not unique to the dam, as there's a reverse waterfall in the Faroe Islands. It occurs due to a wild weather phenomenon known as an inverted waterfall. Imagine a gigantic whirlwind of ocean spray swirling up a steep, 1,542 foot high rocky cliff. So how does this crazy phenomenon happen, you ask? Well, it's all thanks to a spiral column of air that rotates near high and steep cliffs, creating a mini tornado effect. And when the wind hits the edge of the cliff, it gets even stronger and picks up coastal water, which then splashes up the cliff and creates a massive water and wind funnel. Apparently, these inverted waterfalls can happen in other places too, like on the cliffs of Mohair in Ireland, the mountains of Iceland, and even in the Waipuhia Falls of Hawaii. Talk about Mother Nature showing off her skills. Ah, magnetic hill in Lodak, India? The ultimate mind-bending road trip destination? Here, you can watch objects and cars roll uphill like they're stuck in some kind of magnetic vortex. It's an optical illusion that occurs thanks to the sneaky slopes and general layout of the area. The road might look like it's going uphill, but it's actually a downhill road in disguise, playing tricks on your brain like a mischievous magician. You might also see your car moving by itself in the neutral gear. No, your car isn't haunted. It's just basic physics at work. Even when the engine is off, the wheels can still turn, thanks to momentum and the subtle slope of the road. Mount Aragats has a similar story to the magnetic hill of India, this one, too, is like a magnet for thrill-seekers and car enthusiasts. It's located on the border between Turkey and Armenia. It has a reputation for making cars defy gravity. People from all over the world visit this mountain to witness the incredible spectacle, where a car parked on the slope seems to roll uphill all by itself without any driver behind the wheel. There's a nearby river that flows uphill, too. 
People who visited this site claim that it's easier to go up than down there. Number six on the list is the Golden Boulder from Myanmar. The rock looks like it's about to tumble down the hill at any moment, but it's not going anywhere. It's been sitting there for over 2,500 years. The rock is the centerpiece of a stunning pagoda that sits on top of it, towering 49 feet above the ground. According to legend, the rock is held in place by none other than a strand of Buddha's hair. It's no wonder that this place is one of the most important Buddhist pilgrimage sites in Myanmar. The rock was chosen by a celestial king who was impressed by a Buddhist monk's incredible asceticism. So, he used his supernatural powers to carefully place the rock in its current spot, where it looked like the monk's head. If that's not enough, it's said that only a woman can move the boulder. That's why women aren't allowed to touch it. So, if you're up for an adventure, head over to this magnificent rock and pagoda and witness this gravity-defying feat for yourself. Back to the U.S. Oregon Vortex is located on Sardine Creek, Oregon. It's a tourist attraction that's been around since 1930. The owners of the attraction claim that it's some paranormal activity. But it's pretty obvious some clever optical illusions are involved. Legend has it that even before the attraction was built, Native Americans in the area warned that this land was forbidden and horses refused to go there. But then, some gold miners built an assay office there in 1904, and the building ended up sliding to a wonky angle. Now picture this. You're in a cozy spot, away from city light pollution, staring up at billions of stars putting on a sparkling show above you. But if you're lucky enough to be in Marfa, Texas, you'll get a little something extra. Mysterious orbs decide to join in on the fun, shining bright like a diamond, and they've been doing it for over a hundred years. But what are these glowing orbs called Marfa lights? Well, everyone has their own theories. Some people think they're just car lights from the nearby highway, but that's no fun. Others believe that these orbs are actually sentient beings trying to convey some sort of important message to us. Mere mortals. Imagine standing at the edge of a stunning lake, admiring the picturesque view of a majestic volcano. Suddenly, you hear a loud boom and flames shoot up into the air like a firework show gone wild. But don't worry, it's not an eruption, it's just the Kauaijin Lake and volcano doing its thing. This fiery spectacle is caused by a natural phenomenon where sulfuric gases burst through the rocks and ignite upon contact with the outside air. The result? Flames that soar up to 16 feet in height, burning blue like the coolest neon lights you've ever seen. And if that's not enough, the liquid sulfur that streams down the mountain looks like a molten river of electric blue lava. It's equal parts terrifying and breathtaking, and a sight you won't soon forget. Speaking of unforgettable things, the Rachat structure in Mauritania has been an eye-catching enigma for astronauts since the dawn of the NASA space program. This circular feature in Earth's crust was created by a raised dome that was eroded over time, revealing the original flat rock layers. As you move from the center of the structure outward, you travel back in time, as the older rock layers are exposed in the middle. This geological phenomenon is made up of sedimentary and igneous rocks and measures 28 miles across. From space, you can see several faults where the rock layers have shifted and have been pulled apart. The Rachat structure is situated in the heart of the Sahara Desert. There you go. This is our version of the top 10. Would you add something else to this list? You might not think about gravity much, but it affects everything we do. It's the reason why things fall down instead of flying up. It keeps us connected to the Earth, so we don't float away into space when we jump. But for physicists, gravity is something more. It's a fascinating puzzle that needs to be solved to understand how the universe works, and they're on a quest to uncover its secrets. So what's so mysterious about it? Let's see. We've learned a lot about gravity from the legendary Isaac Newton. He was the first to invent the law of gravitation. He taught us that any two objects in the universe can't help but be attracted to each other. It's like they have this secret gravitational crush going on. How strong this attraction is depends on two things. How big the objects are, that is their mass, and how close they are to each other. But here's where it gets cool. Gravity isn't just a two-object dance. It's a complex space choreography. Take our solar system, for example. The sun plays the lead role using its gravitational pull to keep all the planets in their orbits. But each planet also has its own gravitational mojo, 
tugging at the sun and even its neighboring planets. Then, a few hundred years later, another hero, Albert Einstein, took gravity to a whole new level. He described the theory of general relativity. According to Einstein, gravity isn't just a regular force. In reality, it's curving and warping the fabric of space-time. Think of it as a heavyweight champion sitting on a rubber sheet. The sheet bends and curves under the weight, and the smaller objects nearby can't help but roll towards the heavyweight. Now, even though we can't see space's curves with our own eyes, we can see what happens to objects that get caught in its grasp. Getting pulled by gravity is like being caught in a whirlwind of forces. The caught object starts spiraling downward, just like a coin in those penny slot cyclone machines you find at tourist shops. Or it might move gracefully in circles, like bicycles racing around a velodrome track. Gravity is the primordial force that guides our entire world. Without it, there would be no stars, no galaxies, nothing. But where does it come from? Well, that's the million-dollar question. And we don't have a complete answer just yet. But we do have some guesses. First of all, we know that gravity is more than just a feature of space. It's a force that pulls things together. Surprisingly, it's the weakest force among them all. But let's take a different look at gravity. Something that may surprise you. Instead of being a force that directly pushes or pulls objects from a distance, it's more like a dance. Gravity, as amazing as it is, doesn't perform alone in this dance. It shares the spotlight with other forces, like electromagnetism, for example. Let's imagine two electrons. There are dancers. Now, they don't directly push or pull each other like you might expect. Instead, one electron creates a special kind of field around itself, like an invisible force field. This field sets the stage for the show. The other electron senses this field and starts to twirl and interact with it. It's like they're following some choreography. And when we watch this dance, it looks as if the second electron is being pushed or pulled by the first one. But in reality, it's all about the intricate movements and interplay between the dancers and the field they're dancing in. The dancers never touch each other directly, but their interactions through these fields make it seem like they're connected. It's a magical display of fields and movements coming together to create the illusion of forces at play. The thing we call gravity. So even though it's not a force in the usual way, it behaves like one. We call it an emergent force, because it emerges or comes out from the way space and objects interact. Which is why, if we want to get technical, some scientists prefer to avoid the words gravitational force and opt for the term interaction. It's just a way for particles to mingle and exchange energy and information. Electromagnetic interactions, gravitational interactions, they're all part of this grand soiree. At least that's one of the theories. Some scientists also think that gravity might be made up of tiny particles called gravitons. These sneaky particles work behind the scenes, making objects attract each other. However, we haven't been able to directly see these elusive gravitons yet. So, according to this theory, Gravity is both a force and a potential particle. As you can see, we have some struggles with explaining how gravity works on a large scale. But at least we have a good understanding of how it behaves in certain situations, like how planets orbit the sun, or how objects fall to the ground and stuff. But what happens when we zoom into the atomic scale? And what if we venture into the depths of black holes and the Big Bang? Now here's where gravity's wild ride goes off the rails. First, let's enter the realm of quantum mechanics. There's something peculiar that happens in this tiny world. Gravity, the force that pulls things together, seems to take a back seat. On a microscopic scale, other forces like electromagnetism take the spotlight and become the superstars. They're overshadowing gravity. And this leaves scientists scratching their heads, wondering, is this possible? Why does gravity suddenly fade away? So far, we have no idea. And when it comes to the grandest scales, where immense objects like black holes, gravity takes on a whole new level of complexity. For example, inside a black hole, laws of physics and gravity as we know them basically fall apart. It also decays when we try to understand how gravity behaved immediately after the Big Bang. Where did it even come from? We have no idea. In other words, we find ourselves in a cosmic fog when it comes to understanding gravity. But fear not, scientists are working hard to learn more about this enigmatic emergent force they're doing all sorts of experiments and using fancy technology to crack its code. Even though we still have a lot to figure out, we're making progress every day. For example, have you ever heard of gravitational lensing? 
It's like a mesmerizing magic trick. Imagine a beam of light as a fearless explorer, taking a straight path through the universe. But as it encounters the gravitational pull of a massive object, the light's journey becomes a wild roller coaster ride. The gravity of the massive object bends the fabric of space-time, creating a funhouse mirror effect. Our brave beam of light finds itself curving and twisting around the massive object, following a new unexpected path. But as the light changes its trajectory, it also reveals to us distant and hidden wonders that would have remained invisible otherwise. The light can magnify, distort, or even create multiple images of faraway objects. So all the things that have been playing hide-and-seek with us finally become visible, like black holes. There's also a mind-blowing idea called gravitational waves. Einstein predicted their existence tens of years ago, but only recently have we finally been able to confirm them. And that was a huge breakthrough in the science world. These waves carry the echoes of cataclysmic cosmic events, such as the collision of massive black holes or the birth of newborn stars. Just like dropping a pebble into a serene pond, these crazy events cause a ripple effect. But instead of water, it's space-time itself that ripples and warps. Scientists have just recently developed a way to listen to these whispers. They've created instruments capable of detecting these gravitational waves. These instruments, known as interferometers, are like ears that are finely tuned to catch the subtle vibrations of the universe. But one thing's for sure. Gravity is a superstar that shapes our universe. It keeps everything around us connected and rules our entire universe. The quest to unveil its ultimate secrets continues, and it's a thrilling adventure for scientists and curious minds alike. You decide to go out for a morning jog for the first time in your life. You put on your headphones and get ready for something hard and unpleasant. But as soon as you go outside, you feel an extraordinary lightness. At first, you enjoy it and speed up, but then you realize that something's wrong. You're running too fast and too easily. You feel like you've just taken off a heavy backpack that you've been carrying all your life. You're so fast, you think you must have a superpower now. But you notice another athlete running as quickly as you. You notice a puddle ahead of you and jump over it. You jump so far and so high, it feels physically impossible. You fall to the ground, shocked. Then you notice there are no scratches on your body, and the ground feels lighter. You stop the music in your headphones and turn on the radio. All the news reports say the gravity on the entire planet has decreased by half. Thanks to gravity, we stand on the ground and don't fly away into the sky. This power allows our planet to revolve around the sun and the moon to revolve around us. Heavy things seem heavy because of gravity. And now, something has happened to the Earth's core, and the mass of our planet has decreased. This is the reason for the change in gravity. People happily run out of their houses and jump twice as high and further than they used to. Any objects seem twice as light to you. Your body has become lighter, so you can easily stand on your hands. But still, you don't feel like a superhero. You can't lift a car even if its weight was reduced by half. But now, parkour is easier for everyone than before. Your body's weight has decreased, which means you get less damage when you fall. However, panic quickly replaces the joy of the new conditions. It becomes hard for you to breathe, the same as all other people. The air has become lighter. The updated force of gravity has reduced the air pressure by half. Now you feel like you're at an altitude of 16,500 feet among the streets of a usual town. It's like you're halfway to the top of Mount Everest. The air is no longer as dense, and the main part of it has settled in the atmosphere. In the beginning, everyone experiences massive dizziness and panic. You feel like there's not enough air in your lungs, so you get nervous. To solve this problem, you have to learn to breathe slowly and evenly. Thanks to this, you calm down a bit. Others also learn to be more balanced and don't live in a hurry anymore. All of you experience less stress and enjoy every day. Then scientists create unique oxygen masks. You put it on, take a breath, and a special filter puts pressure on the oxygen molecules, making the air denser. After a couple of decades, people will take off these masks as they'll ultimately get used to the new conditions. 
new generations will be born with adapted lungs. The Earth's atmosphere is expanding. It seems the sky has risen higher and acquired a darkish hue. Satellites flying around the Earth's orbit are now inside our atmosphere, but the Earth's gravity still attracts them. You see thousands of satellites burning up. Some of the space debris survives the atmospheric shield and falls to the ground. A meteor shower begins. Space trash crashes into houses, roads, trees, and cars. You and the rest of the people decide to wait out the storm underground, in the subway or basements. Fortunately, the shower doesn't last long. People come out of their hiding and look at the sky in surprise. The moon changes its previous position and slowly flies away. Soon, it disappears completely. Our planet is now like a heavy ball in the center of a huge blanket. That blanket is gravity. It bends under the ball's weight. If you put any light object on the blanket, it will roll down to Earth. But if an object is moving at high speed, it will be able to spin on the blanket's edge and not fall into the center. Thanks to such speed, the moon doesn't fall on us, but at the same time, it can't fly away. Now that gravity has decreased, the blanket has become twice as loose. The rotation speed allows the moon to fly out of our gravitational field. It just goes into space. People will be able to observe the wandering moon for a long time through telescopes. Meteorites might crash into it. It could also find another planet with stronger gravity and will revolve around this new home. The moon may stay in place, but will be revolving around the Earth at a slower speed. In any case, there will be no more tides on our planet, and the sea level will remain the same. In the sea, you can also feel the changes. It's much easier for you to stay on the water, and you can swim faster. But the coolest thing is running along the shore. The splashes are floating in different directions, so slowly and beautifully. The waves are running on the sand in slow motion, too. The weight of cars, planes, and ships has reduced, and so people consume less gas now. You can drive twice as far with a full tank. Fuel transportation is easier, and less energy is spent on flights. Gasoline is becoming cheaper. The decrease in gravity inspires space tourism development. It becomes much easier for people to fly out of the Earth's orbit. Winter has come. You're walking down the street during a snowfall. It seems to you the snowflakes are stuck in the air as they're so slow. You step on the ice and realize that it's almost impossible to walk on such a slippery surface. Your weight has decreased and the pressure of your feet on the ice is twice as weak. You're sliding and can't stop. You often fall, but you don't feel any harm. When the wind is strong, it's hard to stay on your feet. If you jump, you may even fly away. The grip of wheels on the road deteriorates. A driver can no longer brake abruptly. The wheels don't spin, but the car continues to slide for a while. That's why new speed limits are being introduced all over the world. You can still enjoy extraordinary strength and long jumps, but after a few generations, the human body will evolve and fully adapt conditions people and animals will be born taller and bulkier. Majestic tigers the size of a truck are walking through the city streets. Flamingos the size of a plane are flying in the dark blue sky. But the worst thing is that the size of insects has increased too. A regular cockroach can now grow to be the size of a computer mouse, and tarantulas become twice the size of an adult palm. At the same time, all living beings become lighter in weight. Humans will become elegant and agile creatures. Our bones and muscles will stretch. The structure of the entire human body will change. We'll become thinner and smoother. Blood in the veins and vessels will flow more slowly, and it will greatly impair the brain's work, but only in the beginning. In the future, the body will expand. The brain will increase, as will the number of neural connections inside. The lungs will become more sensitive and spacious, people will be smarter and wiser. All devices and materials will be developed according to the new conditions. A cup, a pencil, a plate, phones, and other gadgets. Everything will get lighter and more fragile. If an ordinary person gets into such a world, they'll feel like a superhero. 
You'll be able to punch through lightweight walls and doors and break bricks with your hand. New people won't match your power, but you'll seem too small and clumsy to them. It's normal for planets to be a bit tilted on the side. The Earth is tilted at a 23-degree angle. That's why we have seasons. It's summer when the part of the world where you are leans closer to the sun. It works the opposite way, too. It's winter when you lean away from it. But Uranus is tilted more than normal. It lies at a 98-degree angle, which has a huge effect on its seasons. Each season on Uranus takes 21 years to play out. Something to think about the next time we complain that winter lasts forever. Now, here on Earth, we measure distances in minutes and hours, maybe even days. It takes 10 minutes to walk to your best friend's house, or 15 minutes to drive to your favorite cafe. But in space, it's different. It's vast, which means we measure how long it takes to get to a certain point in years, or in most cases, light years. So, if you want to walk to the moon one day, that would take you 9 years to span the 239,000 miles. Perhaps you'd like to take a ride to the nearby star, Proxima Centauri. Maybe if you kept the pedal to the metal at a constant speed of 70 miles per hour, you'd get there in about 356 billion hours, or around 40 and a half million years. Trust me, after the first 20 million years, you'd be second-guessing yourself as to why go there in the first place. Now, Mars contains the biggest valley, Valles Marineris, we've discovered so far. It's a pretty impressive system of canyons, 2,500 miles long. It's five times longer than the Grand Canyon. Researchers first spotted it back in the 1970s. A bank of volcanoes located on the other side of the canyon ridge probably helped form this valley. We haven't discovered a planet completely made of diamonds yet, but on some planets, it actually rains diamonds. On Jupiter and Saturn, gas giants of our solar system, lightning storms turn abundant methane into soot, which we also know as carbon. The soot falls and transforms into graphite. Further graphite transforms into diamonds with a diameter of about 0.4 inches. Now, before you start figuring out how to book a diamond-collecting field trip, know that these diamonds don't last. After they enter the planet's core, they melt. Ever notice how when you're stargazing two nights in a row in the same time, let's say 9 p.m., the stars stay in the same place, but the moon doesn't? Well, there are two reasons for that. First, it depends on what time you go stargazing. For instance, if you go outside at 8 p.m. and tomorrow you look for it at 11 p.m., you'll see the moon in two pretty different places. In this case, even the stars take different places in the sky since our planet is spinning. As you know, it takes 24 hours for it to make one full circle. That means, from our point of view, it seems like both the sky and everything up there is just moving around us one time per 24 hours. In the same way, the sun changes its position, rising and setting every day. So, if you went outside two nights in a row at the same hour, in most cases, you'll have to wait for an extra half hour or more until the moon gets back to the same position as the night before. The stars are pretty much standing still. It seems like they're moving, but that's because the Earth is spinning. But the Moon is actually moving around our planet and goes through different phases. For example, a new moon is when it's completely dark in the sky. A full moon is when its day side is facing the Earth. It takes approximately a month for it to finish one circle around the Earth. Maybe you'd be luckier on a diamond-collecting expedition on this next planet, 40 million light-years away from Earth. Scientists used to call it a super-Earth. Now, a super-Earth is generally a planet way bigger than ours. This planet, for example, is double the Earth's size. It's so close to its star that it makes a full circle around it in less than 18 hours, which means a year there is pretty short. Since it's so close to its star, its temperature goes up a whopping 4,900 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of the heat, in combination with the planet's density, Scientists have the theory that its core is made of carbon in the form of graphite and diamonds. Over 10 years ago, astronomers discovered a huge water vapor cloud. It was 12 billion light years from our home planet. That cloud is the biggest source of water we know of. It's also the oldest, dating back to when the universe was only 1.6 billion years old. Now it's 13.8 billion years old. Man, if only I had started a savings account 12 billion years ago. With compound interest, I'd have me quite a pile of cash by now, but I wasn't around then. 
Anyway, this cloud is so large it holds 140 trillion times the amount of water in all the oceans on our planet. This cloud kind of feeds a black hole. It may also contain enough gases, such as carbon monoxide, to encourage the black hole to grow six times bigger than it is at the moment. The average temperature of our planet is about 57 degrees Fahrenheit. And the highest temperature ever measured was 134 degrees. Sound too hot? Well, on Venus, it can go up to 900 degrees, which makes it the hottest planet in our solar system. It's not hot enough to melt steel, though. It would need to be higher by 2,500 degrees to get there. But it's hot enough to melt lead. And it's way too hot to sustain life, at least not in any form that we know. Venus is not even the closest to the Sun, it's Mercury. But it has a super thick atmosphere that traps greenhouse gases. It's like you covering yourself with a pretty thick blanket in the middle of the summer. Now, we're used to seeing volcanoes spewing hot molten lava. After all, that's what they mostly do on Earth. But in space, volcanoes tend to spew methane, water, or ammonia. And these materials freeze as they erupt and eventually transform into frozen vapor and something called volcanic snow. I'm talking about cryovolcanoes here. You can find them on Jupiter's moons Io and Europa, Saturn's moon Titan, and Pluto. These volcanoes are especially active on Io, which has hundreds of vents. NASA vehicles have even captured some of these erupting in real time. Plumes of frozen vapor coming out of them extended for about 250 miles. Hey, by the way, they just discovered another moon around Jupiter that might actually be good for farming someday. It's named EIEIO. <laughs> now, what exactly happens to the light after it disappears inside of a black hole? Well, photon is a particle of light. The event horizon is the boundary of a black hole. When something, say a photon, crosses the line and enters those boundaries, it can't escape anymore. But it doesn't mean a black hole destroyed it. It pulls the photon in rapidly towards its center, where an enormous mass is packed into an infinitely small space. But we're not sure what happens to photons in such extreme conditions. It's still one of the biggest mysteries. Does a black hole destroy the light or not? Saturn has 82 moons we know about. 53 confirmed and 29 more that are still on the waiting list to be confirmed as actual moons before they get their official names. And one of the coolest moons might be a 914-mile-wide hunk of rock called Aepetus. It's dark on one side and bright on the other. Its lighter half is 20 times more reflective than the other one. As it turned out, the bright side is ice. The dark side is a bit more complicated. One theory says it's dark because of particles coming from another moon, the one named Phoebe. Another theory says it could be because of heat. Since the moon is rotating really slowly, its dark material is absorbing heat, which makes it even darker. Now, how big do you think a black hole can become? In theory, we can't find an upper limit to its mass. But astronomers believe the ultra-massive black holes, or UMBHs, located in the cores of certain galaxies are mostly up to 10 billion solar masses big. Recently, they even discovered these UMBHs physically can't grow much more than this because, in that case, they would start to disrupt the accretion disks that feed them. That way, they would kind of stuff the source of new material. Most people picture the universe as somewhere between aquamarine and pale turquoise. Even some researchers thought that was the case. They managed to determine the cosmic color by combining light from more than 200,000 galaxies within 2 billion light years of our planet. But the real color is actually closer to beige. Researchers got it all wrong because there was a bug in the software. No, really? <laughs> it converted the cosmic spectrum into the color our eyes would see if we were exposed to it. The team defined this color as a cosmic latte. Ooh, make that a double-shot low-fat large to go, please. People stop their cars on the highway, get out of them, and lift their heads in wonder. In the cities, everyone takes to the streets. Balconies and rooftops of houses are full of people staring at the moon in shock. It's red. Some people scream that it's the end of the world. Some seek shelter. Indeed, the usual white moon now looks like it's been doused in red paint. There's no need to be afraid if you see such a thing. On the contrary, enjoy the view, because you have witnessed a rare astronomical phenomenon. This is a total lunar eclipse. Here's the sun. It's in the center of our solar system. 
Mercury, Venus, and here's Earth and the Moon. The Earth takes 365 days to orbit around the star. At the same time, the Moon revolves around the Earth and completely orbits our planet in 27 days. The Earth creates a shadow zone, and sometimes the Moon passes through it. The shadow is cone-shaped and gradually narrows. The Moon is 238,000 miles away. That's like nine lengths of the equator. At this distance, the width of the shadow is about 2.6 times the width of the Moon. When the Moon is in this zone, direct sunlight doesn't reach it. That is, it should have disappeared, but instead, it becomes red. All because the sun's rays pass through the Earth's atmosphere. They scatter, and most of the blue light disappears. But the red and orange rays continue and hit the surface of the Moon. Voila! You see a phenomenon called the blood moon. By the way, this curvature of light occurs at sunsets and dawns. The atmosphere scatters the blue light, and you see a red and orange sky. If you were standing on the surface of the moon during a total lunar eclipse, planet Earth would be exactly between you and the sun. So you would be able to observe the solar eclipse. The surface of the Earth would become entirely dark for you. All you'd see would be the sun's corona illuminating the edges of the planet. The Earth from the surface of the moon is almost the same size as the moon from the surface of the Earth. Such a red eclipse of the moon is rare because several factors must coincide. One of them is that the moon must be full. Usually, you can see two total lunar eclipses a year. In 2038, you'll be able to see four such eclipses. And the eclipse itself can last up to 108 minutes. But this is rare, and the last time such a long blood moon was seen was in 2000. Many years ago, people didn't know so many facts about our satellite, and the sight of a red moon frightened them. It was a bad sign and a harbinger of trouble. People who knew the schedule of eclipses could take advantage of it. For example, Christopher Columbus had an astronomical almanac and knew when the next lunar eclipse would occur. He frightened the inhabitants of the Caribbean islands when he predicted the red moon. Once upon a time, the moon used to be a red ball of lava. This was way back in time, 4.5 billion years ago. Now this is our solar system. It's full of dust and asteroids. They're constantly bumping into each other, playing space billiards. This is Earth. It's just beginning to cool off from the constant asteroid and comet impacts. But then, Theia appears on the horizon, a planet the size of Mars. It had a chaotic orbit and was approaching Earth in a spiral. A collision was inevitable, and at one point, one of the biggest crashes in our solar system occurred. Theia struck the Earth at an angle. It ripped out part of the Earth's crust and threw it into space. The Earth, in turn, absorbed part of the planet that rammed it. The debris from the collision circled the Earth for a long time. They were a kind of ring, almost like Saturn's. Debris in orbit collided and piled up around a common center of gravity. And that's how the Earth got the Moon. There's a theory that this collision helped give birth to life on our planet. Theia hit the Earth at a perfect angle. If the crash had been head-on, both planets would likely have been destroyed in a massive explosion. If the impact had been tangential, then there wouldn't have been enough debris in Earth's orbit to form the Moon. But we got the lucky ticket. The Moon stabilized the Earth's rotation. The collision shattered the planet's solid crust and allowed oceans to form. Remember, water is the basis of life. When the cores of Earth and Theia merged, we got a powerful magnetosphere. This protects all living organisms from solar radiation. The Moon, along with the Sun, controls the tides. Its gravity seems to draw water to it from the Earth's surface. The Sun does the same thing. That is, if we imagine the Earth as a ball of water, there would be two mountains, one on the Moon's side and one on the Sun's side. And as the Moon moves around the Earth, this mountain of water moves with it. If you were in the open ocean with a tape measure, you would see that the Moon is attracting water to itself by about four to six inches. The Moon is gravitationally locked with the Earth. That's why it's always turned to us with one side, like Mercury and the Sun. But the Moon doesn't stand still. It's gradually moving away from our planet, about 1.5 inches a year. Not quickly, 
But in about 600 million years, it will have shrunk in our sky so much that we won't be able to see lunar eclipses anymore. Do you see this crater? It's Tycho. It's visible during a full moon because of these bright rays that extend thousands of miles from its epicenter. This is the youngest crater on the moon. Scientists say it appeared there due to a meteorite impact about 109 million years ago. At that time, dinosaurs were roaming the surface of our planet, and they may have seen the impact. It was most likely accompanied by a big explosion and looked like a salute in the night sky. Humanity loves to explore the moon. We've sent a bunch of missions there. A total of 12 people have set foot on the surface of the moon. The gravitational force there is six times less than on Earth. So if the average person on our planet weighed about 180 pounds, on the surface of the moon, the scales would only show 30 pounds, like the weight of an average dog. That's why the astronauts moved, jumped, and fell so strangely there. And you would be six times stronger on the surface of the moon. Here on Earth, the average person could lift about 130 pounds, but on the moon, you could raise a big motorcycle or a grizzly bear. The surface of the moon is covered with regolith. This is the lunar dust that covers the solid ground. Such dust is good at preserving footprints. Here's the most famous footprint, which gave birth to many crazy theories. Here's the footprint, and here's the shoe that left it. But the shoe is completely flat. This is explained simply. The astronauts wore extra boots for walking on the lunar surface. They have exactly the kind of sole that left these marks. In addition to the footprints, we left many fascinating objects on the moon. Several lunar rovers, a golf ball, flags, and human waste. There's also a lot of broken satellites and rocket parts. All in all, about 413,000 pounds of human-made objects are there. That's the weight of three passenger planes, or 31 adult elephants. In the future, we plan to resume missions to the moon. New landers will explore the surface of our satellite to find natural resources there. It's also a great place to test new rovers. We're even going to build something like the International Space Station in the moon's orbit, the Lunar Orbital Platform Gateway. It'll be a convenient platform for exploring our satellite and launching spacecraft into distant space. If you start from here, the spacecraft won't need to spend almost all its fuel to overcome the force of Earth's gravity. So such a station would save fuel and money. Scientists hope that we'll be able to mine water from the moon's surface. It's been proven that there's ice there, mostly at the bottom of craters where the sunlight doesn't reach. Perhaps we'll send a rover there that can drill down a few feet into the surface, searching for water. Humanity already has the technology to build a full-fledged colony there. It would take up to three days to get there. We just need to get enough solar panels and building materials to the moon. There's no atmosphere on the moon, so potential lunar inhabitants would be defenseless against solar radiation. We would have to build houses underground to provide protection. Modern 3D printers will help make construction easy and fast. However, food and water supplies can only be maintained by constant supplies from Earth. The same goes for oxygen. Each rocket launch costs millions of dollars, so for now, colonization of the moon is in question. The moon could also become an object for space tourism. Imagine a spaceship launches from Earth, three days on the road, and you're orbiting the moon. The lunar module undocks, and you land on the surface. You ride the rover, explore the craters, then return to the lander. The engines start, the lander returns you to orbit. You dock with the ship and return to Earth. Sounds like some pretty great plans for a week's vacation. Now, you wake up one morning and watch the news while having your morning coffee. They did it again! Those scientists! The news anchor yells on the TV. A report was released a few days ago that the moon is moving further away from Earth's orbit. Instead, it tilted the moon's axis, rotating it slowly. As the moon rotated, the scientists hurried to turn it off before the engine reached its full power as it was headed off course. The brass didn't accept this and ordered them to continue with the objective. The scientists insisted the math wasn't correct and didn't know exactly what may occur. Their concerns were ignored, and they watched as the engine's power increased. The engine slowly pushed the moon, the distance reducing. But as it was provided at the wrong moment, 
the angle it was aimed at would provide complications. The thrust and gravity from the Earth ensured the Moon followed the orbit at a reduced distance. But with the combination of the initial thrust on an indirect angle, the Moon was directed away from the Earth, quickly moving further off its trajectory on a path to leave the orbit altogether. As you finish your breakfast and turn the TV off, you go outside to look at the Moon. It sits high above, seemingly fine. Surely, the news anchor was just exaggerating. You go to work. The issues of the moon are now just an afterthought. Even if it was true, how could it possibly affect your day? The morning feels normal, just another day at the office, as it turns out. During your lunch break, you head into town and notice on your way that the wind is picking up, getting stronger and colder. It must be a storm approaching. You quickly check on the moon. It appears smaller, about half the size of what it was this morning. But it's midday, so it's supposed to be that size, isn't it? After you finish your meal at the restaurant, you leave to find it's becoming darker. The wind is much stronger than earlier, but there are no storm clouds in the sky. People in the streets are pointing towards the sky, shocked at something, probably an eclipse. As people begin running in the streets frantically, you look above and can't see the moon. Confused by everything, you decide to head home for the day. When you arrive home, you turn on the TV. The news anchor, who is now more serious than earlier, explains that the moon has left the Earth's orbit altogether and is flying off somewhere into space. The loss of the moon means the daily cycle has changed. Now, there are only 6 to 12 hours of sunlight a day, and over a thousand days per year. I only have to work half as much, you say excitedly, pumping your arms in the air. The lack of the moon creates a completely different world. The pull of the moon's gravity is what keeps the Earth in a place at 23.5 degrees angle, ensuring the weather patterns and normal days that we're accustomed to. Baffled by all the scientific information, you go outside to just confirm you aren't being pranked. The shorter working week seems too good to be true. As you look out into the sky, you notice the stars are brighter than you have ever seen. You can clearly see the outline of the Milky Way's arms. The stars are far more numerous than you remember, with Venus glowing far brighter than them all. It's a beautiful sight, but you're not sure whether a clearer night sky was worth the moon's removal. You have never been interested in astronomy. You decide to go to bed. It's a good idea to adjust to the new night and day cycle. You set your alarm for two hours. That should be enough, you say to yourself happily. Tomorrow is Saturday, after all. You need to get up early to go surfing. Gotta catch those high tide waves. You wake up, get your things together, and drive to the beach. The news on the radio explains some issues about how the Earth is now more defenseless to asteroids without the moon. Then they talk about some issues with the tides. Something about how the tide is now one-third the size it used to be before. You're unsure how this could affect the waves. Maybe it means they will be larger. You park at the beach, grab your board, and look towards where the surf should be. It should be high tide. But the sea is somehow a lot further away than normal. You shrug off the hurdle of having to walk towards the water. After a long, enthusiastic walk toward the gnarly waves, your mood changes as you approach, staring blankly at the tiny waves. Upset, you head home. While driving, you listen to the news and pay more attention to the information provided. In place of structured seasons, There are only erratic weather patterns. Winds are faster and stronger, creating more powerful storms. And in some places, there are just stagnant conditions. The equator is no longer always warm. The poles aren't constantly cold. The depths of water shrink. Tides only adjust to the sun's gravity, reduced to a third of the pre-moon depths. Throughout the world, the seas change in altitude shrinking at the poles, and the bulge of water around the equator shifts. The moon regulated the tides and provided the periodic changes that were a key element to assisting with life on Earth. 
aquatic life forms are displaced within shallows worldwide. Life cycles of important microbial life have been upset. You couldn't imagine that something as simple as a change in the tides could be so important to billions of life forms. Water and precipitation, which is distributed across the globe, cannot provide sustenance where they did before. The weather has become more extreme, hotter for longer periods, and colder for other parts of the Earth. Over time, some thousands of years in the future, dry deserts will transition into ice ages. These intense changes disrupt the natural order of all things for life on Earth. Not only did the Moon control the tides and weather, but it used to pull molecules within the atmosphere as it moved. The now constant movement disrupts molecules, creating barriers for future evolution. You arrive home, upset after learning the disheartening news. Not only will you never be able to surf again, but all life on Earth will change. An age of devolution has begun. Over the next year, flora and fauna change to adjust to this new world. Migratory animals that would travel toward greener pastures find nothing at all. Birds are completely confused, with no end to the change in seasons. Hibernating animals delve in and out of their shelters at the incorrect times, and vegetation struggles to grow at the lack of sunlight. Nocturnal animals cannot see without guided assistance from the reflection of the moon. Although Venus is the brightest source of light when it's dark, It's only a thousandth of a fraction as bright as the moon was. Predatory animals that hunt during the night are not capable of finding their prey, providing an opportunity for smaller animals to thrive. Although life on Earth has changed, it will continue to exist. But the sudden adjustments will become a test for all walks of life. Over time, it will be very interesting to see what species have adapted and evolved. A world where rats and mice would be more prominent due to their adaptive capabilities could create a new dominant species to emerge. In millions of years of evolution, their descendants will primarily flourish. We could see buffalo-sized mouse herbivores crossing the plains and tiger-sized rats roaming within the jungles. Tree-faring mice with long arms may swing amongst the branches. Others will probably move to the seas in place of mammals to feed upon aquatic life. Wide-eyed predatory rats may occur to have similar traits to bats, with echolocation, becoming the conquerors of pitch-black nights. All the new species that will emerge, undoubtedly, will continue to be monitored by humans, wherever we may be. Have you ever wondered why Earth doesn't have rings? Gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have them. But the rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, don't. Two theories describe how ring systems potentially developed. The first one says that rings may have formed from leftovers that date from the time a certain planet was forming. Or, as the second one says, they could be the remains of a moon that was either destroyed in a collision or broken apart by the gravitational pull of its parent planet. Scientists still don't know why the gas giants have rings, but they think it could be because they formed in the outer solar system. Rocky planets formed in the inner area of our solar system, which is why they were more protected from potential impacts and collisions that might have formed rings around them. Or the reason is that the bigger planets have a larger volume, which allows a ring system to remain stable. Some scientists think our planet did have a ring system a long time ago. In its early stage, a Mars-sized object hit the Earth, and this probably resulted in a dense ring of debris. But its ring system pretty soon coalesced, and that's the way our moon was formed. More than 10 years ago, in 2011, astronomers found a huge water vapor cloud about 12 billion light years away from our planet. This cloud is the oldest source of water that we know of. It dates back to when the universe was only 1.6 billion years old, And now, it's 13.8 billion years old. This unusual cloud is also the biggest source of water that we know of. It holds 140 trillion times the amount of water that the Earth contains in all its oceans. (laughs) Enormous. 
The cool thing is, this vapor cloud is kind of feeding a black hole. It may contain enough gases, such as carbon monoxide, to help its black hole grow even six times bigger than it is now. We all know that Earth has one moon, but there are two more asteroids, 3753 Carinia and 2002 AA29, locked into co-orbital orbits with our planet. The first one doesn't really circle around the Earth, but has some sort of a synchronized orbit with the planet, which is why it looks like it's following the Earth in a stable orbit, while in reality, it has its own specific path around the Sun. The other one, 2002 AA29, follows a horseshoe orbit around our planet. Its specific path brings the asteroid closer to us every 95 years. You'd expect Neptune to be an extremely cold and dark place. After all, it's an ice giant 2.8 billion miles away from the sun. There's not too much sunlight there. So noon on Neptune is similar to twilight on our planet. But this ice giant appears to be creating its own heat. To be precise, 2.6 times more heat than it gets from the sun. This probably has to do with all the pressure near the planet's core. It builds and releases hydrogen, which keeps Neptune's center at a crazy temperature of 9300 degrees Fahrenheit. But its atmosphere is still quite chilly. It ranges from about negative 240 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 330 degrees Fahrenheit. What shape do you think of when someone mentions storms? Probably long ovals of hurricanes and conical tornadoes. But that's something we see on Earth. At Saturn's North Pole, a storm has been raging for at least the past 40 years, and it has a hexagonal shape. Such a weird shape probably has something to do with Saturn's turbulent gas, or maybe even with zonal jets that extend many miles down into a region of extremely high pressure. Have you ever wondered why planets don't twinkle while stars do? The thing is, if you were out there in space, you wouldn't see them twinkling at all. The reason we see stars twinkling is because of Earth's atmosphere. The pin-sized light coming from a star hits the atmosphere. The atmosphere then refracts it, which sends the light skittering off in a zigzag. That's what we perceive as the twinkle. Planets appear much bigger to us than just pinpoints. And yes, their light zigs and zags after hitting the atmosphere too. But those motions cancel each other out, which is why we don't see twinkling, but only a steady glow. In some regions, you can expect big changes in temperature. For example, in Montana, where in a single day, temperatures went from negative 54 degrees Fahrenheit to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, sounds like a lot, but it's still nothing compared to Mercury, where temperatures tend to vary over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit in a single day. They start out at negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit at night and eventually go up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the daytime. Picture a wardrobe you'd need to prepare for a single 24-hour visit to Mercury. Why doesn't the atmosphere of our home planet vanish and disappear into the vacuum of space? Even though we can't see them, the gas and vapor molecules that our atmosphere consists of all have mass. As such, all of these molecules feel the gravitational pull of the Earth, just like we do. They could escape, true, if they had enough energy. For instance, if our planet was closer to the Sun, the atmosphere would be hotter and its molecules could get away easier. But the Earth, fortunately, is just at the right distance from the Sun and has exactly enough mass to keep its atmosphere in the same place. When you think of volcanoes, you probably picture hot molten lava coming out of them. At least, that's how it works on Earth. But in space, volcanoes can spew methane, water, or even ammonia. Up there, a volcano can also spew specific materials that freeze as they erupt. Then they turn into frozen vapor and some sort of volcanic snow. It's a common thing on Jupiter's moons Europa and Io, also on Pluto and Saturn's moon Titan. They're called cryovolcanoes, and Io has extremely active ones. Over there, you'd see hundreds of vents with plumes of frozen vapor that tend to extend about 250 miles. And NASA vehicles have even captured some erupting in real time. Bam! Planets, moons, asteroids, comets, and stars, they can all collide. And galaxies, too. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 2.5 million light years away from Andromeda, our closest galactic neighbor. Astronomers believe the Milky Way is on a collision course 
that will destroy both galaxies in the distant future. Or at least, galaxies as we know them. The two galaxies are going faster and faster toward each other at a rapid clip, 250,000 miles per hour. It will be chaotic, and many planets and stars won't survive the collision. Eventually, these two massive entities will merge and turn into a completely new, unrecognizable galaxy. But here's a small comfort. Scientists assume this is not scheduled to happen for another 4 billion years. In case you want to fuse two pieces of metal together, you already know the only way to do that is to apply heat so these pieces can reach their melting points. In space, you don't need heat to do such a thing, or basically, any action at all. We call it cold welding, and such a phenomenon happens when you slide the metal pieces over each other. In that case, they wear away their protective oxide layers. On Earth, these layers stop them from fusing, but in space, this type of protection disappears. That's why the electrons from one piece of metal just flow into the other piece. And, ta-da, they're one without any effort. Scientists used to believe the Earth was the only planet in our solar system with tectonic activity going on. Tectonically active means plates under the crust are moving. This process releases heat, which then deforms the Earth's surface and leads to its shrinking. But now, we know this happens on other planets, too. Mercury is also shrinking. And scientists found it out in 2016 when the Messenger spacecraft orbited the planet and sent back some important data. It revealed that there were cliff-like landforms known as fault scarfs on Mercury's surface. Since these landforms are relatively small, they probably didn't form that long ago. That means Mercury is still contracting, even 4.5 billion years after our solar system was formed. Jupiter's great red spot is shrinking as well. It's a huge storm that rages on the planet's surface. It's reddish, a bit oval in shape, and more than 10,000 miles wide. Yep, that's big enough to swallow the Earth. And now, it's been slowly but surely shrinking for a couple of centuries. The Great Red Spot is just one of many high-pressure storms that occur across Jupiter, due to all those gases present there, which is something that classifies Jupiter as a gas giant. But just because it's shrinking doesn't mean the Great Red Spot is going to blow itself out anytime soon. It's even growing taller. The space crew had been getting ready for the launch for over three years. The preparations for landing on the strange planet included gathering and studying rock samples in the Grand Canyon, exploring ancient volcano formations in the Nevada National Security Site, and looking into gas and lava vents, lava lakes, and pit craters in various locations in Hawaii. To be able to resist microgravity conditions, they learned how to walk obliquely by being strapped and suspended sideways and trying to move along walls. They had to test their limits through intensive diet and sleep regimens to make sure they'd be safe in outer space. It took them three days, three hours, and 49 minutes to reach the surface of this new world in a place called the Sea of Tranquility. They could have gone for the Ocean of Storms or the Central Bay but they chose this place to land because it had good visibility and it was relatively smooth and easily reachable with as little propellant as possible. One of the first things they noticed when they got there was that, well, the place kind of smelled. This may sound like the beginning of a science fiction novel, but it's actually the true story about how the Apollo 11 mission landed on the moon on July 20th, 1969. Since then, the moon has had 12 human visitors to this day. We think of it as our neighboring space buddy, but there's still much we don't know about this mysterious satellite. And that should come as no surprise, since the moon is actually always showing us the same face. That is because the Earth and its only permanent natural satellite are in synchronous rotation, which makes us think it's always permanently still. The truth is, it's not in a fixed position, and it is actually moving further and further away from the Earth each year by 1.5 inches. Believe it or not, the Earth and the Moon, although being 238,855 miles apart, deeply influence each other. While the Moon is partially responsible for the tides of the seas and oceans on our planet's surface, our Earth is actually to blame for movement on the Moon. They're called moonquakes, and they last way longer than earthquakes, some of them up to half an hour. It may look perfectly round to us on a warm summer's night, but the Moon is actually oval. The lemon-like shape is caused by the Earth's gravitational pull. 
Our moon features more than footprints when it comes to traces of humans. In 1969, American astronauts left many objects on the surface of our satellite, such as two golf balls, a drawing by famous artist Andy Warhol, and a message from Queen Elizabeth II herself. One of the last people to walk on the moon to this day, an astronaut named Eugene Cernan, scribbled his daughter's initials on the moon's surface in 1972. Since it appears there's no wind or any other type of weather change there, the letters TDC could remain there permanently. It's actually possible to be allergic to the moon. Harrison Jack Schmidt, an astronaut from the Apollo 17 mission, spent some time in a valley in the Sea of Serenity, then climbed back into the crew's lunar module but had some moon dust on him. Just as he removed his spacesuit, he got red eyes, sneezing fits, and other allergic reactions that lasted two hours. Since it's so close to us, we've established that the Moon has a time zone of its own. We call it the Lunar Standard Time, but it doesn't correspond to time on Earth. To get an equivalent, the explanation is a bit more complex, but in simple terms, a year on the Moon is split up into 12 days, each one about as long as a month on Earth. Each one of these days got its name after a different astronaut who has walked on the moon. The start date of this calendar coincides with the moment Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. So, the lunar year one, day one, began on July 21st, 1969 at 2.56.15 Universal Time. Since the moon has a very thin atmosphere, it has some pretty crazy temperatures, both hot and cold. They can go up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Over by the moon's poles, however, the temperature is always at around minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Humans have tried to trace the connection between our natural satellite and the Earth for as long as we can remember, coming up with words to explain why the moon's existence influences us so. In the Middle Ages, scientists and philosophers thought that during a full moon, some people were more likely to experience different health conditions. Because they saw this inexplicable connection to the full moon, People with these symptoms were named lunatics, or at times, literally, moonsick. People are not the only creatures living on Earth that are affected by moon cycles. Dog owners are 28% more likely to take their pet to vet emergency rooms during the full moon. You may think that's the reason why wolves have this preference for howling at a full moon, more so in popular culture. But scientists haven't been able to find any connection between wolf behavior and the lunar cycles, so it might as well just be a myth. The largest known crater in our solar system is also found on our moon and is called the South Pole Aitken. This giant formation is located on the far side of the moon and measures 1,550 miles in diameter. One of the many things we've yet to fully understand about our satellite is the unusual flashes of light that can sometimes be seen on its surface. Scientists have named these outbursts transient lunar phenomena or TLP in short, and they have been seen all over the world for centuries. One of the first instances of TLP dates back to 1178, when monks from Canterbury claimed to have seen a flaming torch on the surface of the moon after the sun had set. TLP does not simply mean light flashes. Reports also have detailed other unusual events, such as gas-like mists, reddish, green, blue, or violet colorations, or even the darkening of certain locations on the moon. Is something strange happening with our moon? Is it the beginning, or did we just start noticing it with the newer space study equipment we have nowadays? There are a lot of different theories that scientists have developed trying to piece together what can be causing these events. The unusual flashes on the moon can be caused by anything from meteoric impacts to electrostatic activity. It's difficult to pinpoint the explanation for each event since most of these episodes are recalled either by a single observer on Earth or from a single location. The fact that there is noticeable seismic activity on the Moon can also explain why we can sometimes see unusual flashes of light on the surface of our satellite. When the Moon's surface moves, it can cause different light-reflecting gases to erupt, which can explain luminous developments. Some scientists have even suggested that residual geologic activity may also be the cause. This is all the more shocking, given that we've always looked at the moon as a lifeless world. Did you ever notice that our moon can change its color? There are actually many scientific explanations for that. The moon appears to be a brown-tinted gray, 
when you look upon it from outside of the Earth's atmosphere. When gazed upon from the Earth's surface, the Moon appears to change color depending on various phenomena. The Moon, seen near the horizon, will most likely be yellow or red-tinted. The rarer, blue-colored Moon indicates that you're looking at our satellite through an atmosphere carrying larger dust particles. The Moon can even appear purple at times, but what causes this specific hue is still up for debate. The fact that we don't know exactly if or how much water there is on the Moon's surface is not the main reason why we aren't already building houses up there. It seems that radiation actually has a lot more to do with it. Recent studies have shown that the Moon's surface has a radiation rate 5 to 10 times higher than that you experience on a transatlantic passenger flight. That also means it's 200 times higher than the rate on the Earth's surface. In future lunar explorations, like the Artemis Project, for example, scientists need to take this into consideration, not to expose the astronauts. Named after Artemis, Apollo's sister, this program aims not only to place astronauts on the lunar surface in the future, but also to build some sort of an establishment there to study the moon in safe conditions. While the project started in 2017, the first planned mission is set for launch in summer 2022, with an estimated duration of 25 days. The space object with no crew on board is planned to reach lunar orbit and safely return with sufficient data for the next four-person mission scheduled for May 2024. Artemis 3, 4, and 5 are expected to be launched in 2025, 2026, and 2027 respectively, each with a planned duration of approximately 30 days. About 8 billion inhabitants of planet Earth found out the same terrible news in one day. Someone saw it on TV. Others heard it on the phone while scrolling through social media or listening to music. Some witnessed this news in a dream while sleeping. Someone's voice said it in all languages to ensure everyone understood it. I have good news and bad news for you. Let's start with the bad news. You're all characters in YouTube videos in which your planet gets into a situation where the moon breaks in half. For the audience, it will be a hypothetical story, but for you, these events will become a reality. The good news is that I was joking. There is no good news. But don't worry, the apocalypse won't start on your planet. Maybe just a little bit. Have a nice day. At first, the entire population panics. Then, a few days later, everyone calms down. Maybe it was a mass hallucination and the moon will be all right. But at this moment, scientists have discovered the danger. A colossal meteorite is flying towards us from the distant depths of space. This meteorite is super fast and pretty flat, but has sharp edges. Fortunately, it will miss the Earth by a few thousand miles, but the Moon won't be that lucky. The meteorite flies through our Earth's only natural satellite directly in the middle. So it passes through the Moon, sweeps past our planet, and flies away into distant space. At this moment, all people can't take their eyes off the Moon. The meteorite cuts it perfectly in half, gently, clearly, painlessly. So, what shall we do now? Will the Earth survive this? Our satellite breaks into two equal parts, but fortunately, they don't fly away from each other. The Moon's great gravity attracts them back like a magnet. Scientists are sure that the parts will connect in a couple of billion years, and the Moon will become the same as it used to be. But the coolest thing is that people won't feel any changes. Everyone around the world will celebrate this good news. The voice was wrong. But then, another problem appears. A massive meteorite in the form of a shoe is flying from the deepest space to us. It enters our solar system and approaches the Earth at high speed. The space boot crashes into one half of the moon and then flies away. Now, the moon is definitely breaking into two parts. The first half remains in the same place. The second one is flying towards us. A small meteor shower begins on Earth because of the falling moon fragments. But it's not so bad. Most of these rocks are burning up in the atmosphere. But almost the entire split-off half is falling apart around the orbit of our planet. It forms a stone belt. Now the Earth is like Saturn. Rotating fragments destroy part of our artificial satellites. Communication and the internet work inconsistently. It takes people a couple of years to restore a stable connection. The International Space Station no longer exists. Luckily, all the astronauts managed to return to Earth before half the moon got to them. So, 
Moon rocks are flying around the planet, and people see half the moon in the sky. Life doesn't change much for the first few days, but those who live on the coast of the seas and oceans notice the consequences. The moon used to influence the tides. It was flying around the Earth and made oceans take an oval shape. There were tides on the side where the moon was closer. There were ebbs on the opposite side. But now, this schedule is wrong. Half of the moon attracts less water. Yes, the moon lost half its weight and began approaching the Earth. But its gravitational force has become weaker. Seabirds, many species of fish, sea turtles, and other coastal animals may not survive these changes. Their natural instincts associated with the moon help them determine the time for getting food, breeding, and flying south. For example, tiny turtles expect a strong tide in the morning. They run to the water, but the water doesn't reach them. Turtles can't hide in the ocean in time and become dinner for seagulls. Crabs can't lay eggs because the tide has started earlier than usual. Wolves go mad in the woods. They howl loudly every night and can't stop. The whole natural world can't understand what's going on. The human body is also feeling some discomfort. Many people have low and high blood pressure, and some experience severe headaches. Half of the moon changes the entire ecosystem of the planet. Adapting to new conditions will take several tens, maybe hundreds of years. A couple of weeks pass, and people notice the days are now shorter. The moon always slowed the Earth's rotation and made one day last 24 hours. The Earth is spinning faster now. The night and the morning come earlier than everyone is used to. Earth rotation speed has increased and reduced the number of hours per day to 15. People suffer from insomnia or oversleeping. The body needs time to get used to it. Work schedules are changing all over the world. Previously, people came to the office at 9 and left at 6. Now, they arrive at 7 and leave at 2 p.m. Sleep time got shorter, and people are really sad because of this. Progress slows down because the short working time. The technologies of the future are now 20 to 30 years late. Hourly pay remains the same, so bosses now pay less for fewer working hours. The whole moon stabilized the weather and climate on the planet. Look at Mars, it has two small moons. They quickly spin around it and rock Mars around on its axis. As a result, strong winds, sandstorms, and thunderstorms often happen on the red planet. Now the half of the moon that approached us takes the Earth out of stable rotation. This changes the seasonal temperatures in the world. It even gets hotter in hot places. And snowstorms are raging in cold regions. There are short, massive downpours instead of sunny weather. A typical breeze can grow into a hurricane and small waves into a tsunami. The seasons are changing faster now. Winters are colder and summers are hotter. Changing the rotation of the planet affects the Earth's magnetic field. Since the compass and navigation systems are unstable now, we need to recalculate where the north and south are. Birds can't fly south to wait out the winter since they don't know what direction to fly. Their inner compass is broken. Several hundred years have passed. People are entirely accustomed to the new conditions on Earth. New species of animals and fish have appeared. Birds can navigate the sky by the moon again. The planet's economy has been restored. Hourly wages have become higher. People now get enough sleep from 5 to 6 hours a day and work for 4 to 5 hours. The reduction of day and night has also affected the entertainment industry. Movies now last one hour. One episode of some TV series lasts 30 minutes. Life goes faster. An average person now lives to be 96 years old. In fact, the passage of time hasn't changed at all. Its calculus did. Several thousand years have passed. People look different now. Now they have big eyes that absorb more light. Half of the moon doesn't shine as bright as the whole thing, so the nights have become darker. It took the human eye a couple of thousand years to develop the ability to see clearly in this new dark. Animals need to navigate better in these conditions, so their eyes have become larger and more sensitive. During all this time, people have cleared the orbit of moon rocks. Several space stations fly around our planet. And again, People hear this strange voice that once told them that they were all characters in one hypothetical YouTube video.
This time, the voice says, Your story ends because the video ends. I'm sorry. Good night. It was hot in the tropics, a type of heat unknown to the men aboard the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria ships, led by Italian explorer Christopher Columbus. It had been months since these men left their home cities in Europe, and until then, Europe was all they knew. They were given a difficult and even dangerous task. Spain hired Columbus to find a new western route to Asia. They needed new routes for trading and buying spices, but it was far from a simple job. I mean, crossing the ocean never is. Little did those sailors know that their lives were about to change forever. Land in sight! Someone must have shouted on board. But when they finally stepped on that new foreign land, they discovered they were not in Asia. They had landed in the Americas. You've probably heard this tale before. Historically speaking, Columbus arrived in the Americas in 1492. But what would have happened if Columbus's ship had faced a lethal storm in the Atlantic Ocean and had never made it to the new land? What would today's history look like? First things first, nobody discovered anything. When we say that the Americas were discovered, we're kind of ignoring the millions of people who already lived there. You see, the Americas were only discovered from Europe's point of view. Columbus would only have discovered something if when he got there, he was faced with acres and acres of empty land. But that was not the case at all. Second, Columbus was not the first explorer to land in the Americas. Believe it or not, the Vikings approached American shores in the 10th century. Their expeditions have been well documented and accepted by scholars. Here's what might have happened. Around the year 1000 CE, Viking explorer Leif Erikson sailed to a place called Vinland. Cute name, huh? It's now a region in Canada called Newfoundland. But his crew didn't stay too long. They arrived to find 10 Native Americans napping under their overturned canoes. They attempted some trade, but I'm guessing the Vikings weren't too friendly and the Americans didn't really like them. The Vikings' account of the encounter shows they felt outnumbered and menaced, so they sailed away back to their land. That makes sense, right? As I said earlier, there were millions of people living in the ginormous continent of the Americas. Any foreigner would be outnumbered there. Now take a look at what North America looked like before our buddy Chris got there. It was not divided into the normal states we're used to. And if Columbus had never arrived, the United States would probably never have been united to begin with. After all, there were hundreds of first Americans living in these lands, and they lived amongst their own tribes, quite different from the Europeans. It's not accurate to think that there were no political systems going on in the Americas before Europeans arrived. We just need to understand that they were different from what we're used to today. When Europeans arrived, they imported their belief systems with them, from religious beliefs and language systems to things as simple as clothing habits. If the Americas had developed on their own, maybe their sense of fashion would be completely different today. You see, Europeans had a developed sense of fashion by the time they arrived in the West. They wore things such as this and this. But those don't really work in the tropics, do they? For them, Fashion had to do with showing a certain economic status, while in the Americas, that didn't exist. For Native Americans, clothing was mainly functional and related to the weather. In warmer climates, Native people would wear short-like cloths to cover their intimate parts. They would walk bare-chested and use shoes known as moccasins, yes, similar to the moccasins you probably own. In colder climates, they would resort to using leather and fur parkas. Of course, there was always the special clothing used for ceremonial purposes. So I'm guessing that if Columbus never reached the Americas, brands such as the Gap, Hollister, and Forever 21 would have never existed. But we could live with that, couldn't we? Here's a wild thought. Let's say that by the 1700s, Native Americans had developed complex engineering skills. They built big boats, maybe a bit smaller in size than the traditional European ships, and decided to venture across the ocean. Let's say they were the ones who arrived on European shores, in places such as Spain and Portugal. They carried gifts and goods with them for trading, of course. 
This was also a common practice amongst them back home, known as potlatch. Sure, they were received with suspicion by the Europeans, who had only ever traded with Asia. But with this inverted encounter, a different type of relationship began between Native Americans and Europeans. Since Europeans didn't claim ownership of the Americas, the people from the so-called New Land weren't considered inferior to them. Actually, they stood side by side as equals, each one with their own power and set of knowledge. Native Americans taught Europeans a new type of ruling system, a more decentralized one. So modern-day structures of government would look really different. Maybe Europeans decided that four years was a long time for someone to hold decision power, so they implemented smaller and more frequent elections. Oh, and the landscape of European cities also changed a lot. Instead of huge statues made of copper and bronze showing men and ships on their way to the Americas, the Europeans built totem poles in honor of their alliances with first Americans. In terms of medical and medicinal knowledge, they had a lot to exchange about. While Europeans were making advances in traditional medicine, Americans had developed an impressive knowledge of herbs that could heal a series of things. Before they knew it, Europeans were selling different varieties of plants in their pharmaceutical establishments. They had one big barrier though, language. Since Europeans never arrived on American shores, they also never taught their language to Americans. So maybe in this scenario, both cultures brought in their best linguists and tried creating a new language from scratch. Something that could be comprehensible from both perspectives and that could encompass both of their worldviews. The implications of this on modern day life would be really profound if you stop to think about it. Let's say that this newly created language involved some symbols and drawings in it. You see, Native Americans often told stories using symbols known as pictograms. They were quite literal sometimes. As you can see, a mountain was represented by, well, a mountain. It's crazy to think that this system of communication has been around for 5,000 years since it was actually invented by the Sumerians. And hey, maybe even our laptop keyboards would come equipped with these symbols, and you could write more visually hybrid and fun emails than the ones you write today. The American landscape would have also changed. You see, if neither Columbus nor any of the other European dudes that went after him reached the so-called new land, Central and Latin American cities would look completely different than they do today. Maybe the bustling empires of the time, such as the Inca, the Maya, and the Aztec, would have grown immensely. To be fair, they were already pretty big by the time Europeans got there. Some pre-Columbian Maya cities were as big as medieval London and Paris in terms of population. But oh my, the Mayan Empire would have grown so much that it could have spread out all over of Central America. They could have developed their pyramid building craft up to the point that they managed to build an even larger pyramid than the Giza pyramid in Egypt. So tourists would come from all over the world to visit. Ah, and in South America, let's just say the region could have turned into a huge forest, bigger than the Amazon. The Inca could have spread through the Andes and then into the mainland. Places such as Brazil and Argentina never existed. But in their place, there would have been dreamy tropical settlements, which would have become a worldwide reference in sustainable living. The moon is the Earth's closest space neighbor and its only natural satellite. It likely formed when a huge Mars-sized object crashed into our planet billions of years ago. I wasn't around then. This catastrophe turned Earth into a scorching ball of molten rock. It also pushed some material into its orbit creating the moon. Now, this heavily cratered sphere moves around our planet. This causes high and low tides around the globe. A bit more than one-fourth the size of Earth, it's the fifth largest natural satellite in the solar system. The moon has several phases. For example, new, full, or crescent moon, first and last quarter. But whatever the satellite looks like, you can always find it in the night sky, and sometimes even during the day. But... Imagine waking up at night and noticing that the moon looks somewhat different than usual. It seems brighter and bigger. It's hardly noticeable, especially when you're half asleep. You go back to bed, unaware that instead of the moon, you've just seen Mercury. 
close up, this planet, the nearest to the Sun, is similar to our natural satellite. Its surface is littered with craters left by space rocks. Mercury is about two-fifths the size of our planet, but it's still a bit larger than the Moon. That's why the planet would have a greater influence on Earth. Nights would become brighter, high tides would become higher, and low tides… Mm, what do you think, lower? Yup. The lunar cycle, that's the time the Moon, or rather Mercury now, needs to go through all the phases, would become 14 hours shorter. But all in all, such a replacement wouldn't have any drastic consequences for our planet. But then, how about Venus? What if, instead of the familiar satellite, we swap in the third brightest natural object after the Sun and the Moon? It's often called Earth's sister planet because their mass and size are nearly the same. Venus would be as large in our sky as Earth once appeared to the Apollo astronauts when they looked at it from the Moon's surface. The morning star would be much brighter than the Moon. For one thing, the planet reflects six times more sunlight. Plus, it would occupy an area at least 16 times larger. That's why nights on Earth would be as bright as early twilight now. If you looked at Venus, you'd spot vague swirling patterns in the planet's yellowish-white cloud cover. Venus wouldn't become Earth's satellite. The two planets would likely orbit around their common center of mass, and this orbit would be quite eccentric, like me. But if Venus moved with the same speed as the Moon has now, the two planets would crash into each other in the nearest future. Uh-oh. Okay, let's pull another switcheroo. If Mars was up there in the sky instead of the Moon, you'd surely notice it. Even without a telescope, you'd be able to marvel at its unusual color and dark spots on its surface. And even if you didn't see the red planet, you'd still feel something unusual. Mars is half of Earth's size, but several times larger than the Moon. Replacing a smaller space body with a much bigger one would upset the delicate balance on our planet. If you were unlucky to be at the seaside when Mars took the Moon's place, you'd have to evacuate as soon as possible. Massive waves would rise in the oceans under Martian influence. They would crash against the shoreline like the largest tsunamis. Mars would be reflecting more sunlight than the Moon. Nights would be lighter. Terrestrial landscapes would have an eerie red tint. And you'd be able to admire the tallest mountain in the solar system, Olympus Mons, through a telescope. Mars isn't large enough to change the Earth's orbit dramatically. But with time, the two planets would probably begin to orbit each other, creating a binary planet system. And since Mars would literally be next door, voyages to this planet would become a reality. Okay now, think really big. If Jupiter replaced the Moon, Earth, as an independent planet, wouldn't exist anymore. It would instantly turn into another moon of the largest planet in the solar system. The only positive moment in this transformation? People would have an awesome sky view. Jupiter is dozens of times larger than the Moon. A gigantic, beautifully striped sphere would cover nearly all the horizon. If you had time to enjoy the show, you'd see yellow, brown, red, and white clouds floating in Jupiter's atmosphere. Sadly, the gas giant's gravitational pull would instantly cause severe earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and tsunamis. Earth's mantle and crust would be drawn toward Jupiter, which would break the planet apart. It'd be stretched and compressed with such force that its surface would bulge back and forth by more than 300 feet. Unfortunately, Earth's speed is only 10% of the speed needed for us to stay in Jupiter's orbit. That's why our sluggish planet would crash into the gas giant in less than a day. Well, that sounds unpleasant, so let's not do that. Now, if Saturn were to replace the Moon, it would be a sight to behold. The planet is more than 35 times larger than our satellite. It means the giant golden globe would cover 18 degrees of the sky, and its rings would stretch even further, from horizon to horizon. Hey, if you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. Earth would be a bit further away from the gas giant than its own moon, Dion. And since Saturn is way more powerful than our planet, Earth would turn into its satellite, not the other way around. Unfortunately, Earth's rotational speed wouldn't be enough to keep up, and we'd most likely crash into the much larger planet within a day or two. But before burning up in Saturn's atmosphere, we'd have to pass through its magnificent rings. They're made up of pieces of comets, asteroids, and shattered moons. It wouldn't be an easy feat to get through this space debris. Plus, our planet would have to avoid Saturn's moons, all 53 of them. 
But what if the fall didn't happen, and Earth did turn into Saturn's 54th moon? Then the gas giant's gravitational pull would lead to massive tectonic shifts all over our globe. They would be tearing the planet's crust apart until there's nothing left. Hmm, not good either. Both Uranus and Neptune are ice giants. These planets are the same size, larger than Earth, but smaller than Saturn and Jupiter. They both have icy interiors, deep atmospheres, and similar color. Very beautiful bluish-green. If either of these planets replaced the moon, the consequences would be the same. So, let's flip a coin. Okay, it would be Neptune you'd see in the sky one day. Neptune is 14 times larger than the moon. The planet would look like a bright blue hot air balloon in the sky. Not only at night, but during the day, too. It would appear to be 15 times larger than the sun. If everything else remained the same, a solar eclipse would seem to continue for ages. Once the sun vanished behind Neptune's edge, our planet would be plunged into complete darkness for no less than an hour and a half. Neptune is 17 times the mass of Earth, and its gravitational pull is much stronger. That's why our planet would end up as a satellite, yep, again. It would orbit Neptune slightly further than its own largest moon, Triton. By the way, there would be a great risk of Earth colliding with this space body. But let's assume we were lucky enough not to cross paths with Neptune satellites. Even so, there would be more than enough problems on our hands. Tides on our planet would become a thousand times more powerful than those caused by the Moon. Neptune's gravitational force wouldn't pull Earth apart, but it would heat our planet up. The seismic activity would increase, setting off earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. And probably louse up the internet, too. Arcturus, a huge red star. It's just bursting from inside out. The red sea of plasma on its surface rages and pulsates. The star burns anything that comes close to it. And now, plop, Arcturus is gone. But at the same moment, it reappears at the center of our solar system, replacing the sun. What we see in the sky isn't a small yellow dot anymore, but a giant red ball. It's 25 times wider and 30% heavier than the sun. Even though Arcturus is a little cooler, it's still a total nightmare for Earth. The distance from our planet to the star is now 25 times less. All the water in the oceans and rivers begins to evaporate. What used to be rainforests are quickly turning into a lifeless desert. But sunsets and sunrises now look amazing. Imagine yourself on the roof of the Empire State Building, watching the sunrise. First, you see the light over the horizon. It almost blinds you, because Arcturus is 110 times brighter than the sun. Then, the star gradually climbs over the surface. The thick dot on the horizon gets wider and wider. It continues to grow, until the red star is everything you can see. Arcturus is now so close that you can even see storms of hot plasma on its surface. There are periodic outbursts and mass ejections. Huge amounts of matter are ejected from the surface of the star at speeds of up to 1,200 miles per second. The matter takes the form of a loop attached to the star at both ends. And you have to wear a super-advanced spacesuit to be able to observe such a sunrise. Life on Earth ceased to exist long ago under these conditions, and it's going to get worse over time, because every eight days, Arcturus's brilliance increases, and soon, our planet will become more like Venus. It's so close to the Sun that the high temperature makes any life there impossible. Okay, let's let our planet cool down a bit and put Proxima Centauri in the center of our solar system. It's not a red giant, but a red dwarf. This star is almost seven times smaller than the sun and almost nine times lighter. Now our oceans and rivers are not evaporating, but freezing over. Forests and jungles are covered with snow. In about a week, there won't be a single place on Earth where the temperature is above freezing. Even plants that are used to the cold will cease to exist. They mostly feed on the sun's energy. Now they begin to starve. But there will still be water deep beneath the ice layer. It'll be heated by the hot core of our planet. Microorganisms will still be able to survive. It's much darker on Earth, too. It's like an endless twilight here. Oh, and we can barely see the moon. The thing is, it doesn't produce its own light, but reflects it from the bright sun. 
With Proxima Centauri instead, the moon will lose its brightness. Hop on the bright side of life together with our brand new tees, hoodies, and more. Click the link to pick your choice. But an even bigger problem would be with our orbit. The sun has a certain gravitational force, and it keeps us just in the sweet habitable zone, where we're not too hot and not too cold. Proxima Centauri's gravity is much weaker, and Earth is slowly drifting away from the star. We now run the risk of encountering asteroids flying through space, or even other planets. But the worst case scenario is if Proxima Centauri simply can't hold our planet, and we fly away into dark space. Then, you can forget about any forms of life here. Now, let's put Sirius at the center of our solar system. It's the brightest star in our night sky. It's only 70% bigger than the sun, but almost twice as hot. So its glow is not only bright, it's sizzling. And its light is not yellow, but somewhere between blue and white. You couldn't go out in the city without sunglasses, or serious glasses. <laughs> Still, you wouldn't want to walk the streets, where the asphalt is boiling anyway. You could literally fry eggs on the curb. Of course, by this time, all life on Earth has long since disappeared. But it's not just because of the temperature. Sirius emits enormous amounts of radiation. Our atmosphere serves as a shield against the sun. But in the case of Sirius, that shield wouldn't be enough. Now, why don't we take a more bizarre approach and make ourselves a double star system? These are two stars that revolve around a common center. And there's our Earth, safe and sound. It's all about the size and brightness of the stars. These two aren't too big, and they give off as much light as our sun. All that matters to us is that our planet is in the safe zone of the double star system. At sunrise, you first see one star appear from below the horizon, and then, a couple of minutes later, the other. The only problem is that this beauty may soon explode with enormous force. In binary systems, one star is always heavier than its companion. Sooner or later, it starts pulling matter away from the smaller star. Gradually, the bigger star just eats its neighbor. Then the big brother can reach a critical mass and explode. This explosion would be about as strong as a supernova. It would destroy our entire solar system. The light from this explosion would be visible for hundreds of light years away. And after that, there would be a huge nebula in the place of our star system. It's stardust and particles that are left from our world. Going to the realm of the crazy now, a black hole. Yes, there's one at the center of our solar system now. We know black holes are scary, mysterious objects that pull in everything in their path. But even around a black hole, there is a habitable zone. You just have to be far enough away so that it doesn't drag you down into its black abyss. Mercury and Venus would be too close to the black hole. So most likely, they'd be torn apart and then head for the event horizon. This is the last stop before hitting the singularity, the heart of the black hole. There are only two problems, light and time. A black hole pulls light in instead of emitting it, so the Earth will quickly become dark and cold. And time goes slower around heavy objects. Near a black hole, one second can be equal to weeks or even months away in outer space. We won't feel this difference, but the entire universe around us will develop faster relative to us. Any object can become a black hole if it's compressed to a certain size. For example, the sun can become one if it's shrunk to a width of 3.7 miles. And even the Earth, if you squeeze it to a width of 0.7 inches, it becomes a black hole. Oh, now there's some little rock lurking in the center of our solar system. It's a neutron star. It's about 18 miles wide. Some meteorites are much bigger than that, but it has a mass comparable to the sun. So its gravitational force is about the same, and our planet's orbit is intact. But the problem is that neutron stars emit next to no visible light, so it's now permanent night on Earth. Still, it gets very hot here. When a neutron star is born, it can be several times hotter than the sun at first, but it quickly cools down to the temperature we're used to. So there's a chance that all life on Earth hasn't yet been scorched. 
Another problem is that these little guys are rapidly spinning and can become pulsars. It's kind of like a powerful spotlight on two sides of a spinning star. Neutron stars also eject radiation at tremendous speeds. These rays will make our planet literally sterile. No life form would be able to exist under these conditions. And now, it's time for the biggest star ever known, Stevenson 218. This red giant is 2,150 times larger than the Sun. And if we place it at the center of our solar system, its edge will lie on Saturn's orbit. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter are already swallowed by the huge star. Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are roasting like chestnuts on a fire and will soon evaporate. In fact, this could happen to our Sun as well. The older it gets, the redder and bigger it becomes. It'll eventually run out of its fuel, hydrogen, and the Sun will start to burn heavier elements in its core. This will cause it to expand. Then we'll see more beautiful sunsets and sunrises, but the temperature will become too high. In theory, the Sun will get so big that it'll swallow the Earth, and then it'll explode in a supernova, leaving nothing of our entire solar system behind. Shiny! Ah, consider the rogue planet, the cosmic wanderer that nobody wants to take home. Basically, a rogue planet is a planet that has been ejected from its own star system and is now floating aimlessly through space like a cosmic loner. These planets aren't just a theory. Scientists have actually detected some in our galaxy. In fact, estimates suggest that there may be lots of these cosmic nomads floating around the Milky Way. And they aren't just small rocky worlds like Earth. Some of them are actually massive gas giants, many times larger than Jupiter. These behemoths could potentially have their own moons, and even their own mini-systems orbiting around them. For example, one of the most famous rogue planets we know of has a complicated name. Here, you read it for yourself. It's located about 80 light-years away from Earth, and it was discovered in 2013. This rogue planet is estimated to be around 6 times the mass of Jupiter, and is believed to be around 12 million years old. And yes, just because these cosmic loners don't have a star, it doesn't mean they're super cold. They can still generate heat and light from their own internal processes. Some may even have magnetic fields and auroras, just like Earth. In other words, rogue planets could potentially be habitable, if they have the right conditions. So, what would life on such a planet look like? And could we potentially live in such a world? Well, living on a rogue planet can be a lonely existence. They have no warm sun to bask in, no cozy atmosphere to cuddle up in, and no cosmic neighbors to have barbecue with. That's why we'd have to get creative. Let's start with the most obvious problem. We'd have a hard time without light and heat. So how do we fix this? Well, we'd probably have to invest in some really fancy space heaters and wear fashionable super warm spacesuits. Or we could invent a whole new way to generate electricity without relying on solar power. For example, how about using geothermal energy? Now that's hot stuff! Each planet has an internal source of heat. Without it, they would all be nothing more than cold, lifeless rocks floating through space. This internal heat can be harnessed and used to power everything, from homes to factories to spaceships. It's like having a hot tub big enough to power an entire city. And that city, most likely, will be located underground, closer to the heat source. And as for light, well, we'd probably have to build some really bright flashlights. Or maybe even learn to genetically engineer some bioluminescent organisms to light up our homes. Just imagine, space space is overgrown with neon mushrooms and plants. By the way, speaking of plants, plant life would be pretty hard to come by without a star. So, what would we eat? Well, we could use the same geothermal vents that we talked about, or some chemical reactions to sustain ourselves. And hey, maybe we'd develop a taste for sulfur-rich foods, or we'd start fermenting our own drinks from the bubbling volcanic mud. Yum! But besides food, we'd have a more important problem. Living on a rogue planet would be breathtaking, literally. We'd have no air. You see, not all rogue planets have good, stable atmospheres. 
It all depends on their size, composition, and other things. But even if our new home does have an atmosphere, it may be incredibly thin and unstable. We'd have no pretty blue skies or dramatic sunsets to admire. Instead, we'd be staring out into the infinite void of space, where the stars would be brighter than ever before. And forget about weather patterns. Without an atmosphere to create them, we'd have no rain, no snow, and no thunderstorms. And that's just some minor problems. What's worse, the temperature on the planet would be wildly fluctuating, swinging from unbearable heat to unbearable cold. It would be like living in an oven that's always being turned on and off. And finally, we'd be exposed to all kinds of space debris and cosmic radiation. So, if you don't want to get crispy, you might want to invest in some serious SPF. So, how do we fix it? Well, we'd have to find a way to generate our own oxygen and probably create something like a space-age biosphere. For example, we could grow some plants that could produce oxygen or we'd learn to filter the air like a high-tech air purifier. Finally, we have the last most important problem, finding water. And here's where the underwater oceans come to our aid. Now we're really diving deep into the possibilities. Nyuk, nyuk. But seriously, scientists suggest that some of these planets may indeed have underwater oceans. It would be like living on a giant water balloon that's been buried underground with the ground beneath your feet made of ice and rock. In other words, we could just tap into these underground oceans. They could provide us with a source of water for drinking, farming, and manufacturing. Maybe even with some other resources and materials we've never seen before. And by the way, who knows what kind of strange creatures might be lurking in those underground seas. But don't worry. Even if we don't have any underground oasis, there are also other options. We could get some water from comets, ice mining, and even from the atmosphere, the one we just created before. Finally, we need to find and mine some resources to build our homes and other stuff. And a rogue planet might not have the same kinds of resources as a planet that orbits a star. It's like trying to find some treasures in a desert. Not exactly a sure thing. We may have to rely on resources from nearby asteroids and things like that. And if we want to extract resources from the planet itself, we might need to drill down through miles of ice and rock. But hey, if you're up for the challenge, there'll always be a chance you'll strike it rich on a rogue planet. And who knows? Maybe you'll discover some new resources that are even more valuable than gold or diamonds. Great! Looks like we've solved the most important problems. Now, there may be other small difficulties. For example, We'd also have to deal with some seriously long days and nights, depending on how fast our planet was rotating. And we wouldn't have a normal, regular day-night cycle. The rotation of our planet could be wildly unpredictable. Maybe we'd have weeks-long nights, followed by weeks-long days, which could really mess with our sleep schedules. We might have to develop some really strong coffee to keep us going through those long, dark nights. But, hypothetically, we can adapt to all these things and overcome all the challenges. And now, finally, welcome to the rogue planet, where the sun never rises, but the adventures never end. Thanks to our advanced technology, we've managed to create a comfortable and habitable environment in this once barren world. The sky above us is now a beautiful shade of blue, filled with fluffy white clouds and the occasional flock of flying creatures. Don't ask. As we venture out from our underground habitats, we're greeted by a world that's full of surprises. Strange plants and animals have adapted to the unique conditions of this planet, some with bioluminescent features that glow in the dark. And be careful if you want to go swimming in the underground ocean. They might be home to some bizarre creatures who want to feast on… well, we'll come back to that. Maybe. As you can see, we've created sprawling cities and thriving communities, powered by the planet's geothermal energy. We also created a bunch of artificial light sources that keep things bright throughout the dark, chilly nights. Of course, we still have some problems with navigation and timekeeping, but things aren't as dull as they used to be, are they? Overall, living on a rogue planet would definitely have its challenges, but it could also be a pretty exciting way to experience the universe. And who knows? Maybe someday we'll find such a planet 
and actually turn it into a bustling intergalactic metropolis someday. But until then, let's enjoy and tidy up our dear Earth. Yep, there's ice all around, as far as the eye can see. A white desert covers the entrance to your cave, the one where you and a bunch of other settlers live. Everyone's gathered around a fire pit, trying to keep warm, telling each other stories about how much snow they saw the other day. Some are running around playing tag, throwing sticks, whatever people used to do for fun 300,000 years ago. You're one of the earliest Homo sapiens to ever walk the Earth. Others are sleeping or just resting their eyes. All around the cave, all you can hear are stomachs rumbling. Sounds like a wild animal lurking around. You look out the mouth of the cave and see that the storm has cleared. Time to grab some tools and head out as a group. In the open wilderness, you find some berries covered in snow and plants that might be edible. But it's not enough to feed the whole tribe. It's the Ice Age, and there's not much vegetation growing anywhere. One of your friends spots some large footprints in the snow. The chase is on. You can't tell what it is, but it should be enough to feed everyone for a couple of days. As you go deeper into the snow-covered forest, you hear a growl behind you. You hope it's your stomach, but you look behind you and suddenly black out. An ice age is a period when large sheets of ice cover everything, changing the Earth permanently. It's partly responsible for the raising and lowering of sea levels, as well as the current layout of the continents. Picture monster-thick ice sheets spread across what's now Canada, Scandinavia, Russia, and even South America. That's all caused sea levels to change drastically, and temperatures around the world fell dramatically. And I'm not talking about just one ice age. There were a bunch of them. Scientists say there have been five major ice ages throughout history, lasting for millions of years. And we're in the middle of one right now. Relax, don't panic. It doesn't mean we're all going to be sleeping next to bonfires, trying to keep warm after being out all day looking for woolly mammoths. And no, there won't be a massive geological ice storm that freezes everything in its path. Ice ages have warmer periods in them that come and go, lasting for tens of thousands of years. In fact, billions of years ago, the Earth was one giant snowball with no life on it. And the Sun back then was also just a cute little fireball without enough heat to melt all that ice. But as the Sun got bigger and hotter, Earth's ice slowly melted away, leaving the green and blue ball we have today. We're living in the Quaternary Ice Age that's been going on for the past 2.6 million years, and counting. Some animals have thrived in this latest ice age, like whales and sharks. They've been at the top of the food chain for ages. Under them are seals, certain kinds of fish, otters, all the way down to tiny plankton. Up on the cold surface, mammals had to grow thick and shaggy fur just to stay warm. Ancient mammoths, rhinos, and bison were known to have thick rugs on them. They looked awesome. They were herbivores and ate small shrubs and whatever grass they could find. But several thousand years ago, temperatures began to rise, and most of these animals became extinct. The ones that remained evolved into the elephants, hippos, and rhinos we have today. You wake up from your blackout and find yourself face-to-face -face with a creature that kind of looks like a modern-day bobcat, except it's much bigger and furrier. It's a Smilodon, an epic version of a saber-toothed cat with a mean look. It's around the same size as a male lion and has two front fangs that make me think twice before leaving the safety of my cave. They look scary. But scientists think their bite wasn't as powerful as today's tigers or lions. What made them tough were their giant forearms used to wrestle down anyone who got on their nerves. In packs, they were even able to take down mammoths. Either way, you don't want to be waking up next to this kitty. It's staring you down ready to pounce. But you and your friends keep calm and slowly back off. 
you get the genius idea to throw a rock to distract it, then run. Nowadays, it's near impossible for a human to outsprint a lion or tiger, but humans back then were much fitter. Once the danger's over, everyone continues to look for food. It's getting dark, and you haven't found anything to bring back to the cave. Suddenly, you smell something burning. Way off in the distance, you see a thin column of smoke rising into the sky. Another settlement? You and your friends look at each other and approach the smoke cautiously. Homo sapiens first came into being about two or three hundred years ago. But human history didn't just pop up out of nowhere. As far back as seven million years ago, some of us decided to call it quits. We left our chimpanzee ancestors in the jungle and started doing our own thing. And that didn't just happen once. Over those next millions of years, there were over 20 different human species. Some were our ancestors, some were twigs from a completely different branch. Some were tiny, others better adapted for hot or cold weather. Before you know it, you see a group of Neanderthals cooking some meat, sharpening their tools. Neanderthals were the first to migrate to Europe. Scientists believe they were around somewhere between 40,000 to 400,000 years ago. They occupied all areas between Europe and Asia, while Homo sapiens, that's us, were still all the way down in Africa. You enter their camp and immediately see the differences between each other. They're stocky and look a bit different, but there are some similarities, like flat teeth for chewing and gnawing and big skulls for their big brains. They even have clothes on, like you. According to archaeologists, they lived in shelters and made tools out of stone, sticks, and bones. They welcome you inside and give you a tour like no other. You're officially meeting another human species. They take you inside their cave and show you some of their cave paintings. They were the first artists of their time. Many of their galleries are still around today, like the ones in caves in Spain. You know their style, minimalist paintings of deer, a large handprint. They also dabbled a bit in jewelry making. They made necklaces out of eagle talons and animal fangs. They were also probably the first ones to harness the power of fire. Did they discover it when a bolt of lightning hit a tree? Or when one of them dropped a rock on another rock, creating a spark? No one really knows. But they were able to recreate it and use it to keep warm, to cook food, to see in the darkness, and to protect themselves. After the nice tour, you hang around the campfire to keep warm. They even offer you some extra clothes for the journey home, mostly thick, shaggy mammoth coats. If only you could talk to each other, that would be awesome. But it's getting dark, and you need to head back to the tribe. You say your goodbyes and thank them for teaching you how to draw a deer, and for that sack of food they gave you. The Ice Age was important for the development of the modern Homo sapiens. Because of the extreme cold and other harsh conditions, they had to adapt to survive, be extra clever and innovative. They developed advanced tools and even used bone needles to sew warm clothing. They may have hosted the first ever runway show. When the climate started to get warmer, they developed farming techniques to sustain themselves and mainly settled near large bodies of water like rivers or lakes, while others opted to be near seas and oceans. They, I mean we, were even the first to domesticate animals.